that's a that's a classic. That is a classic judge. Yes, yes. correct. Yes. Yes. yes, it's a classic. Everyone, please be seated. I hope everyone was able to find parking easily. All right, defense, call your witness. Judge, Your Honor, I don't believe we have officially arrested this All right. Arrest. All right. Defense, call your first witness. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, uh, state calls Mr. Adame. All right. Well, you can raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do, Your Honor. All right. You can lower your hand. Just make sure you keep your voice up for members of the jury and the court report. If you'll state your name for the record, please. And the Adam. Um, All right, defense. Good morning, Mr. Adam. Uh, May we've met before? Yes, ma'am. Uh, since the time that you were here before, have you reviewed any records from CPS? No, ma'am. And you did know you were subject to the call, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Directing your attention to uh, the last interview that, that Heather Bryant had with uh, the uh, Lasoya family, um, as far as you know, she never examined Mercedes' body that day. Ma'am, I do not have personal knowledge of that. I was not there that day when Heather Bryant conducted that body check. Your Honor, I'd like to uh, show Defense Exhibit 2, which are the CPS records, all 6,015 15 of them. They're on a thumb disk here that Mr. Munoz is going to show. Judge, my objection is there's been no foundation laid. Uh, it's hearsay. All right. With regards to him viewing the records, he is allowed to view the records, and then the court will uh, respond to any objections as to hearsay. With regards to foundation and relevancy, that's going to be sustained. So you'll need to lay the foundation, what's the purpose, and you'll need to show that it's relevant by asking this witness questions. Have you ever seen the entire file, Mr. Munoz? Uh, I'm not Mr. Munoz, man. Oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, Mr. Adame. I'm sorry. Have you ever seen the whole file? I have glanced through the file. Yes, ma'am. But particularly paying attention to what I was involved in. Is that the whole story to CPS? Only people, people only handle what they're involved in, not the whole case, not the whole person? There is different divisions in, in Child Protective Services. The division that you're talking about with Her Heather Bryant is the Child Protection Investigation, CPI is what it's called. She is in a different, in a different, organ like a different section 
of Child Protective Services other than myself. We don't answer to the same supervisor, so to speak. Is there any chain that follows the child all the way through? I think it's more of a collective, and we all have bits and pieces, ma'am. So when Mercedes Lasoya died, I came into that piece of the puzzle to investigate predominantly just her child death. Did you bring anything with you in terms of knowledge to the death scene, to the hospital where the child was pronounced dead? Just my training and experience from previous previous child death investigations, ma'am. So you didn't know about any of the history, is that right? Whenever I was called to the scene, no, ma'am. I called uh, San Antonio Police Department that was on scene, and then I responded. Your group is called Child Protective Services, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What do you do to protect a child from being killed? I'm going to add Dr. Relevant. It's the same. What do you do to protect a child? I'm going to add Dr. Relevant. It's the same. What do your job duties entail? My job duties as a special investigator. I conduct investigations into child death involving abuse and neglect. I conduct any kind of serious incidents such as, uh, or serious injuries such as broken skulls, broken bones, burns of, un, uh, of no nat nature that can be really explained that involve abuse and neglect. I've worked in uh, labor trafficking cases involving children, sex trafficking cases involving children. I've been involved in uh, cases involving uh, law enforcement, involving our own employees, school personnel who perpetrate on children at school, in addition to some of the investigations involving our foster children uh, in Child Protective Services. But you did nothing personally to save Mercedes Lasoya. Object to relevant and argument. Say. Did you do anything personally to save Mercedes Lasoya? Object to relevance. Say. Your Honor, we're here about Mercedes Lasoya, just argument in terms of that. We're here in terms in because of Mercedes Lasoya and it's not relevant what was done to protect her. The objection has been sustained. Do you recall the last person to interview or, or uh, confer with the family of Mercedes? Which um, you are you referring to her paternal side or her maternal side? Whoever had her. Do you know who had her? The maternal side, our mother, Catherine, our Katrina Mendoza. What was done? What was done with what, ma'am? I'm trying to understand your question. Mercedes Lasoya, was she the subject of the investigations? Or was it Katrina? She was listed as a victim in that investigation. And in this particular one, the last one, Katrina Mendoza was listed as the alleged perpetrator. So your job is just follow up when it's all over. Is that right? Uh, in this I, know, me, I know you've given descriptions, but from what I see of your involvement, it was only to follow up when it was over. Is that wrong? When what was over, ma'am? The child's life. She was dead. Mercedes' life. Mercedes Lasoya's life. Yes. When she passed away. Yes, I came into the piece of the puzzle to investigate why she died, what were the circumstances that led to her death, 
and to figure out all that information in telling her death. Is there any path in CPS to ensure something like this doesn't happen again? Object to relevant. Specifically, what, what behavior is, is required of a CPS person in the, in the, to help any child? Object to relevant. Um, you know, I'd like to introduce this. Have you seen any of these records? These 6,015 pages? Uh, can you clarify what these records are? I thought I'd show them. Thank you. Okay, do I have permission to move along the wall? Yes. Thank you. What was wrong? Go ahead. I just asked for permission to move. It's not detective, it's just a special investigator. Start from here and go down. Yes. This all looks like criminal history. <coughs> criminal history. There's, there's all right, been, so just one second. The this, reason, while you all are having the conversation up there amongst the three of you all, do you want that on the record or not? Because it's difficult for the court reporter to hear. I understand, you're right. I, was, I wasn't having a conversation. It's my understanding he had a question, and um, I, I would respectfully ask that all questions come from her. So 
Oh, are you done, sir? Or uh, more time? No more time. Then, Don, as soon as he's finished reading everything, we'll go back on the record. Is something about the record? Yes. Some of the ones that are not involving the child death, I am not familiar with those. No, ma'am. Those are cases from before this one. Okay. How, how, early, how far back did you go? Uh, I looked at that document that he showed me. Scrolling through most of them, yes, ma'am. Um, did you see a train in there where there was any connective tissue that would follow through? Uh, I'm going to add a draft if we can testify anything in the record that we're going to be making evidence. All right, that's going to be overruled. You can answer the question if you know the answer to the question. I'm going to tell All right, you can answer the question if you know the answer to the question. <laughs> Ma'am, the connective tissue is maybe that it's Mercedes Lasoya, it's Jordan Lasoya, and her mother, Katrina Mendoza. Yes. And then I also seen uh, their father as well. So, was it helpful for you to see them at all? helpful in what way, ma'am? In, in that you're able to understand what's going on with this case of the death of Mercedes. Again, ma'am, my focus was in on the child death portion of that. Maybe I asked for the wrong witness. Who would I ask for that has the overall picture on how to save a child? I'm going to object to relevant sustain. Who should I have called instead of you? I'm going to object to relevant sustain. Best witness. Any questions? Just one, Judge. Uh, Mr. Donnie, you mentioned that Katrina Mendoza was an alleged perpetrator. Were there any other alleged perpetrators? Uh, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that question. Okay. I said you testified that Katrina Mendoza was an alleged perpetrator. Isn't it true that Jose Ruiz was also an alleged perpetrator? Yes, ma'am. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, is this witness excused? Yes, from the same. No recall, Your Honor. It doesn't. All right, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you can't discuss your testimony with anyone or watch anything. The only persons you can speak to are attorneys for the state or the defense. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Defense, call your next witness. Your Honor, I'd like to call uh, the district clerk. Just one Your Honor, we would object to this um, on relevance. All right, we'll, we'll see what the district clerk has to say. <clears throat> Your Honor, this could be ordered that the state stipulate. Uh, uh, no. Your Honor. Here's, stop. Witnesses need to be called. The court will hear any objections at that time. The requests for stipulations need to be done outside the presence of the jury, and I think both parties are aware of that. No, Your Honor, I'm sorry, I wasn't. All right. The request for stipulations need to be outside the presence of the jury. Thank you. 
and just give us a moment. Your Honor, apparently um, the clerk isn't here yet. Uh, I'd like to instead call, recall Katrina Mendoza. All right, if deputies, if you all could bring Katrina Mendo Mendoza. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have you all step outside for a moment because since Miss Mendoza is being called back, her attorney needs to be here as well. So remember my instructions. We're off the record now. You're not allowed to view anything. You're not allowed to start deliberating individually with yourself or with each other. You're not allowed to watch anything or do any investigations. Does everyone understand? Yes, sir. All right. And I assume the room is open for you all, the jury room.
All right, Dr. Cannon, if you could unmute, please, and start your video. Where is it showing on? He needs some of you to start his video. Where is it showing? It's not showing yet because he hasn't unmuted or started his video. Where will it be showing? It's right here on the screen. All right, uh, Dr. Cannon, if you'll unmute, please. All right, if you can make sure you keep your voice up so that uh, we can hear. Oh, yes, ma'am. Awesome. All right, defense, call your next witness. Good morning, Dr. Cannon. My name is Teresa Connor. No, 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 call your witness, counsel. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. I'd like to call Dr. Cannon. All right, you may be seated. Uh, Ms. Dr. Cannon, can you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear and affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God? Yes, I do. All right, you can lower your hand. State your name for the record, please. Yes, my first name is Rajesh, R-A-J-E-S-H. -E last name Cannon, K-A-N-N-A-N. -A -N. All right, this witness is appearing by Zoom. Any objection to the witness appearing by Zoom? State. No objection. Defense, any objection to the no witness objection. appearing by Zoom? No objection. Mr. Ruiz, any objection to this witness appearing by Zoom? No, ma'am. All right, defense. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, you're here specifically regarding the autopsy that you performed on Mercedes Lasoya on February 8th of 2022. She died on the 7th, but it's my understanding you performed the autopsy on the 8th. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and uh, do you have those papers in front of you? Yes, I do. Okay. Going through this, this uh, the whole record, which is extensive, um, your first contact about this case was with whom? Um, <clears throat> it's really when I um, saw the case. Do you recall speaking with, doc, with Detective Lawrence Size? Uh, it's probably at the time of autopsy. When was the time of autopsy? Uh, on uh, February the 8th, 2022. At what time? Uh, it's about 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. And how long did it last? Uh, autopsy, probably a uh, few hours. You don't remember specifically with this one? No, no, ma'am. Is it noted on the form anywhere? I didn't notice it. Uh, no, it just whenever we finish them. I'm sorry, so what did you say? Whenever we finish. Whenever you finish. So yeah. you, don't, you don't necessarily notice when you finish, though. Okay. No, no, you don't. So, when you started the autopsy, Imagine, uh, did you observe the outside of the child's body first, or did you go inside? Where's your procedure? Oh, no, uh, it, it's a routine to look from top to bottom, outside uh, document, take photographs, and then we'll uh, look inside. Did you reach any conclusions from the observation outside? I did the observation outside, yes. Yeah. Did you make a decision based on what you saw? Uh, no, ma'am. We had to um, <clears throat> go inside and then uh, wait for every test, and then we had to decide. What kind of test were you waiting for? Uh, in this particular case, um, I did um, do additional uh, microscopic uh, examination of the tissue. Which tissue was that? A particular place? Um, uh, yes, we uh, we uh, did the comprehensive study on uh, uh, on all the tissues, the major organs including heart, lung, liver, um, adrenal gland, pancreas, spleen, thymus, uh, intestines, and then also the kidney portion of the skin. And the kidneys, I did additional uh, tests uh, for a stain for myoglobin, which is M-Y-O-G-L-O-B-I-N. Now, when you performed the autopsy, you didn't have any prior information, is that correct? Uh, prior information, 
prior to that child being on your table? No, no, it's all started, uh, it all started uh, at the time of autopsy and after the autopsy. Uh, Dr. We met with the Excuse detectives. me, Dr. Cannon, I know you're probably yes. having difficulty hearing, but when an objection uh, is made, I'm going to need you to stop talking so I can make a ruling on the objection. And attorneys, uh, okay. you need to use your microphones. All right, you may continue, Dr. Cannon. Uh, it's at the time of autopsy and after. Who was present with you when you performed the autopsy? Uh, it's from the um, law enforcement. I, I believe it's the detective saying, but I could be uh, could be others. I, I can't remember. It's not specifically noted who was there. Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. When you uh, looked at Mercedes. When you looked at her, you didn't have any initial first impressions? Object to leading. That'll be over, Rose. You can answer. Yes, uh, yes, first impression is yes, this child uh, suffered trauma. How much trauma? Well, it's extensive from um, top to bottom, all over the body. Was Dr. Molina present when you were doing this? Object to leading. Uh, no. All right, Sorry. that'll be over, Rose. You can answer. Uh, no, ma'am, no. She was not present. No. When you do an autopsy, do you have anybody helping you? Oh, no, it's, it's just me. And possibly detective size. Uh, yes, they, if they come for observation, uh, we allow them because they are the lead uh, law enforcement agency. Evidence of medical intervention. Your notes indicate the defibrillator pads are present on the chat chest wall. Yes, sir. Near puncture is present just above the right knee. Correct. And intra sepsis in intro. Oh, shoot. Thank you. The needle yes. is inserted in the left shed. And that, yes. that indicated that somebody tried to save the child. Yeah, it's from the hospital. It's pretty routine to see this. All right. Now, the first thing, the first thing to note I have here is that the head. What do you recall about Mercedes' head? Uh, yes, uh, I listed on each section uh, because um, the injuries are pretty um, all over. So the head had a lot of abrasions or scrapes. And on the front, uh, back, cheek, and also the back had a small um, a tear of the skin as well. Where was that, sir? In the back of the head. The top? What part of the back? In the back. In the back. Just plain old center back? Or? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. okay. And what do you think that was from? Did you the tell? Uh, I guess it's a blunt trauma. Blunt trauma? Yes, ma'am. Would you have considered that a okay. cause of death? No, that's not alone is the cause of death. But was it significant enough that potentially it could have been a cause of death? Uh, well, like I said, uh, we don't infer just on one small tear. It's the overall picture which matters. Yes. So that tear wasn't enough to give you a, a distinct impression at that point? Is that fair? Is no, not no. Okay. You talked about uh, Mercedes' lip, a broad yeah. five by three centimeter area of erosion with overlying line, superficial layer of thin, tan granulation tissue. What does that mean, granulation tissue? Yeah. It's, uh, I'm sorry, Aaron, I'm going to object and reading from the document that's not in. All right, that'll be overall. Uh, yeah, what it means is it's a tissue trying to heal. What part of the face was it? It's uh, on the inner side of the lip. Inside of the lip? Yes. Could it have been a 
or did you ascertain what the source of that injury was? No, we can't tell. Like the child biting the inner side, inside of your mouth? No, it's not biting. It could be uh, any kind of trauma on, on top of the uh, uh, lip. Did you notice some missing teeth? Yes, I did. Do you remember how many? Um, a few. Was it unusual for a child of this age to have missing teeth? I mean, one is, we can happen uh, if they fall, but quite a few with overlaying trauma with different stages of healing is not common. It indicates there is some repeated trauma. For, for how long a period? It's probably um, days. Days? Yes, ma'am. Were any, were, these were her, her baby teeth, as we play people call them. Was that what yes, we saw here? Yes, that's right. Okay. Forgive me with these words, but present on the prox proximal mid occipital scap head are two contusions measuring two by three centimeters. What is that? Uh, it's is that um, on the back of the head uh, are um, uh, contusions, are bruised. Were these recent? <laughs> they appear recent, because. And when we say recent, are you talking in terms of hours, days? I, I would say days. point in time begun to formulate a cause of death in your mind? Uh, no, um, because uh, these are complicated cases um, and we need to uh, gather all the information. Why was it complicated? Uh, because uh, when I also need to look inside the body, not just outside. And inside the head, I did not see any obvious immediate cause of death. So it was not, can I, is it fair to say it was not the uh, focus of your examination, her head? Uh, head is a main part of the examination, but I also look at other uh, cavities like chest and abdomen. The abdomen. Um. We talk about a cluster of three contusions measuring one to two centimeters present on the lower left abdomen above the inguinal region. Was this done with, can, can you ascertain what caused these injuries? Um, it's just um, some kind of blunt trauma and uh, I can't really tell exact mechanism how it happened, but there is some trauma. You talk about her fingers being swollen. What is that from? Was there an obvious injury there, or why? No, uh, what it is is it's, it's an injury, but the tissue is reacting to the hand, and, and that is it's, it's the swelling is common in injury. Even post mortem. Uh, well, it's around the time of death, so yeah, I can still observe it. But it was observable, that's the... That yes. Thank you. Her arms had several different kinds of contusions, is that correct? Yes, that's right. There was no evidence of sexual assault, am I correct? I did a complete examination and uh, collected uh, trace evidence 
Um, I'm not sure if somebody did, but based on my exam, I um, examined the inside of the um, anal canal, vaginal canal. I did not see any tears or trauma. Okay. At any point, did you examine her throat? Yes, inside, yes. Did you see anything there? But no, I could not see anything. There was an allegation against the mother in her indictment that she had shoved a utensil down her throat. Did you observe any injuries from that? I mean, not at the time I was dead, no, man. No, there was no evidence of trauma. Inside the throat? That's right. Uh, the child, did you know the child had asthma? Was that obvious to you? Um, I looked for signs, but I did not see anything did not, obvious in the body, nothing in the body. Typically, if a person came before you and had asthma, is that something you would notice right off the bat, or you have to look for No, it? no, uh, because asthma, I remember, uh, they don't come to medical examiner. It's a treatable condition. And uh, we have signs of asthmatic attack when they go to hospital. Typically, they tell us what happened. And we can already know what to look for. In this case, that was not obvious. But have you seen deaths from a bad reaction to asthma? Oh, yes, yeah. You did a full dissection of, of Mercedes back, is that correct? I examined, yes. It says a full dissection of the back. Yes, yes ma'am. Now, I've seen autopsies on television, forgive my lack of knowledge. Do you turn the child over to examine the back or? Correct, yes, we have to. Okay, and you cut the back as well? Yes, yes. Um, Specifically, what did you observe that could have caused her death? Well, I mean, uh, like I said, all the injuries in the back, like around the buttocks, there were uh, uh, blood seeping into the deep tissues, which indicates the injuries that I observed on the top went a little bit to the bottom. But again, these are only skin and soft tissue injuries. And that is not the immediate cause of death, but it can contribute to the death based on the severity and the distribution in a small child. There were, from from our, um, reviewing your report, said there was no evidence of, of skull fractures. That's yes, right. The hyoid bone, where is that? Hyoid bone is a, a U-shaped bone, especially in a child. It's in the neck. Um, and um, it's very flexible, very uh, soft and thin in a child. And you said that the hyoid and larynx are intact. Yes. The hyoid bone was dissected and there was no evidence of trauma? Correct. The airway is patent and unremarkable. Yes. Did you notice subsequent, or rather, excuse me, before this, is it fair to say that you did not see the ER charge nurse's uh, report? I, you know, we look into it, but we don't look into that much detail uh, because I have the body in front, and if necessary, I'll go back and read. If um, the charge nurse had said that he removed food from the child's windpipe area, would that have affected anything that you looked at? Uh, well, the thing is, we need to know, is it really significant? 
because there is sense of terminal aspiration, meaning if uh, somebody is um, in the process of dying and the breathing kind of is not normal and sometimes food can get aspirated. So it, it is, we have seen that before, that's not the sole cause of death. But it could be. Uh, it, only if it is significant, like a big chunk of meat, and then that needs to have evidence, like somebody saw somebody choking and went blue and then suddenly died, not slowly deteriorating. So it's a different scenario. When you observe uh, this autopsy at Mercedes, could you determine whether it was a sudden death or uh, a It did not death? seem to be, uh, based on the scenario presented, it seems like the uh, patient or the uh, child was deteriorating for a while. Um, stomach and intestines it says the stomach is distended with large amounts of partially digested food material which consists of partially digested fragments of what appears to be thin white noodle like material along with soft white material is that something very unusual or not unusual not unusual it just depends on what they ate Were you able to determine what the actual food was? Uh, no. Just noodle life? Yes. Thank you. You tested for COVID. Yes. And what was that? Uh, just many at the time tends to rule out if anything else was going on. Thank you. Now, I noticed in your microscopic examination of the lungs that the, the alveoli were slightly dilated and there were scattered, minute, elongated foreign material in the alveoli under polarized light. Could that have been the noodles? Uh, no, I think it's probably over time, um, something in the food, um, what she ate could have been there. There's a whopper of a word here, E-O-S-I-N-O-P-H-I-L-I-I-C. Would you pronounce that? Uh, yeah, e eosinophilic. Eosinophilic infiltration. No, no evidence of that? Yes, yeah, so what it is, is I'm describing uh, those are signs of asthma. And, and I didn't see any acute uh, signs of asthma attack. So I'm saying a negative finding. Mucus, uh, well, there's also no mucus bugs or thick and bronchial muscles, correct? Yes, so again, those are also signs of asthma. It said that there was decalcified, a decalcified media, medial end of the clavicle. What does that mean? Uh, what it is is I took a small segment of collarbone and then um, um, he can cut the bone so he had to thin it out and then look under the microscope just to make sure that there is no problem to the bones. It's not a brittle bones or anything which can fracture. So documenting a normal finding just to be thorough. There was a, a comment here that 
healing, healing abrasion of the skin, crater-like ulceration of dermis. What does that mean? Uh, I did a section of um, uh, the trauma or the uh, uh, scrape, which looked like old, and I want to confirm it. And it confirmed that it's a old li uh, skin lesion. Again, couldn't we ascertain the cause? Well, it's trauma. The tubules, where are they? Uh, that's in the kidney. There's evidence of necrosis in the kidney? Uh, the um, a kidney under a microscope uh, the tubules are the small tubes which collect the uh, transport the urine and those under the microscope show evidence of damage meaning the kidney is failing. They failed prior to her it's death? Just, or? It's not functioning. But, but was this prior to her death or? Uh, this is around the, the time of death. Around the time. Is that unusual? Yes, it should not be there. How did it get there? If you know. I'm sorry. I'll repeat your question. How would that get there? That it crosses? Uh, so the, the damage is caused in this condition uh, by uh, the products of the muscle being broken down by repeated trauma and kidney is a filtering organ so it can handle the load and shutting down. Okay, we're almost through. Excuse me. The findings um, <coughs> multiple blunt formus, form of force injuries of the body and they're extensive. Evidence of rhabdomyolysis. Which, would you explain rhabdomyolysis, please? Yes, yeah, so the word rhabdo means muscle in Latin, and lysis is breakdown. So what's happening is, <clears throat> due to the repeated trauma to the body, um, whatever injuries you see on the skin is affecting the muscles underneath and the muscles over time break down and the small molecules of the muscle get to the bloodstream and to the kidney and then eventually everything shuts down. Are you able to quantify? The, no. You're not able to quantify the, the degree no. in which they broke down? No, not, I can't quantify it. Is there a test that would quantify it? No, I mean, we are even lucky to detect this stain in the kidney, which detected it, so that's the best we can do. But there's no definitive determination about this, is there? I mean, that is uh, what it is, and then and, and we know that based on the um, circumstances of the day, the extensive injuries of the dead uh, on, on the body that it's result in of trauma. You said the circumstances of the death. When you yes. performed this, were you aware of circumstances of this death? After the autopsy, yes, yes. At this point, when you wrote the, you wrote the form, these forms after the autopsy, not the work. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, we have to wait for all the evidence, uh, talk with the uh, uh, investigating police agency. And then I have to come to a conclusion after. People can survive rhabdo. Can I use the shortened term rhabdo? They can, they can yes, survive. if you are uh, made to hospital in the right time, not at the end stage, yes. The testimony indicates that she was, she was brought to the hospital with no life signs. I think she was pretty much collapsed. Now, which muscle was it that caused her death? 
the culture. Why not? Why not? Well, we can uh, say which one is just in the all over the body. Well, you have muscles in your legs. Was it the muscles in her legs that caused her death? Oh, any muscle. Any muscle could cause her death? No, here in this particular case, the breakdown is the silks, not muscles. The break, I'm sorry, so the breakdown of what? Uh, of the muscles, uh, any part of the body. So if just your leg muscles broke down, that would kill you? No, not just alone. Uh, the extent of the injury and over a period of time, it just adds up. But at some point, there's this specific muscle that will cause the death, right? Objectively. No, I'm not. Asking. All right, just one moment. All right, what is your objection? Object to leading and also object to ask and answer. Sustained. <clears throat> it's fair to say that you don't know specifically which <clears throat> muscle broke down to cause her death. No, we can't say. So could you have been wrong with that? I'm sorry? Could you have been wrong in your in your analysis? Object to argument. No. Then. All right, that'll be overruled. No, I'm not wrong. It's just my opinion and, and we agree with the other doctors. Uh, it was um, quality control analyzed, so we had a discussion. So it's not just my opinion alone. And nobody else was able to determine which muscle it was that... No, happened. I don't think anybody can. That's not how it works. Well, it, it's kind of important to be specific here. No, I mean, as a doctor, we can only do so much. Now, you notice that she was reported to have weakness and altered mental status for a few days. Who reported that? Do you know? Uh, it's not a hospital as well as the law enforcement agency. And where would they have gotten their information? I'm not sure. I, I don't know. The only who, who would have known prior to her death? The hospital. Uh, who was taking care? Whoever was taking care, yes. Yeah. Or not taking care, as the case may be. Object to sidebar, you sustained. Reportedly, it says the decedent was reported to have weakness and altered mental status for a few days and was terminally witnessed to collapse suddenly and went unresponsive while being fed. Witnessed to collapse. Your Honor, I object to her reading from the document that's not in evidence. Sustained. Can I ask your next question? I'm considering your honor. Now you have a fact here um, that there was evidence of terminal aspiration. What was that evidence? Just like the uh, 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 foot particles, a uh, little bit of microscopic evidence of possible uh, in the lung alveoli. In your report, you, have, you indicate that asphyxiation could not be ruled out. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Would this be evidenced by the terminal aspiration? No, there's nothing to do with that. What does it have to do with, Your Honor? I'm judge. No, doctor, excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I mean, um, so I did receive uh, information from the law enforcement agency that in the past, uh, there was evidence of um, loss of consciousness due to the nose and mouth being covered, and that is a form of asphyxia. So what I'm trying to imply is if it happened in the past, I can definitely rule out that happened at the end. You have um, a note here, as per the investigating police agency, and who was that? The uh, San Antonio police. I subpoenaed 
in addition to subpoenaing you, I subpoenaed the police records and the medical records. Uh, object, Your Honor. Sustain. What I subpoenaed was not provided. All right, you excuse me, counsel. You need to ask the question. We're not here about your subpoena. You need to ask a specific question. State's objection will be sustained. Ask your question. Did you receive any written medical reports? Uh, yeah, I finally reviewed uh, medical reports as well as police reports. Do you have the whole file in front of you there? No, not, not the file, no. Do you have your bench notes? Uh, no, I don't. I, I have my report, which is the uh, permanent record. But you do make bench notes during the course of an autopsy, don't you? Uh, yes, that, that's for transcription purposes only. Do you recall any particular notes that you might have made that were not provided? No, I mean, anything uh, important or relevant, significant will be in my report. I'm sorry, significant what? Information will be in my report. You have a notice here that the investigating police agency, in the past before death, the decedent was made to hold heavy objects and outstretched arms and the upper extremities were strapped to a pole with bandage to hold them outwards. Do you remember where you got that information? From the police agency. And you have no idea where they got that information? Um, no. relevance. Sustained. <coughs> Uh, there's a report here that the witness that the decedent was witness to suffer to suffer asphyxial events in the past. Again, that's only from police reports, not not from your personal knowledge. Is that correct? Not from my personal knowledge, no. Why did you say that asphyxia could not be ruled out? Object to ask and answer. That'll be overruled. You can answer. Uh, more well, well, what it is is uh, in, the, in the child with extensive trauma and with prior history of uh, trauma and especially with the history of asphyxial event in the past, I cannot for sure rule out the same happen at the end. If her, her uh, bronchial, if her rib pipe was blocked, could that have been a cause of death? Like I said, that is a very specific event. Uh, they need to have those specific findings and the terminal circumstances should indicate that without any prior trauma or any injuries on the body, then it's a different scenario. So it's case by case basis and that's not what happened here. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yeah, he's on the seventh mark. He's on the seventh mark. Can she approach? I meant the court reporter. I'm sorry. Yes, you may approach the court reporter. Dr. Kanan, do you have the investigative report and an autopsy report in front of you? I have the autopsy report. And what is the case number on your report, which is different? On. Um, it's uh, 2022-0365. All right, so here's my question. Is she seeking to admit that into evidence? Yes. Or is she, is there going to be any objections to that being submitted into evidence? Your Honor, I object to the state of it. It does have highlights. Um, which All right, does anyone have a clean copy? I can, I can put one off of here.
Dr. Kanan, do you remember how many autopsies that you performed a year while you were here in San Antonio? Oh, in each year? I'm sorry? Uh, is it per year? Or? Yes. When you were here in San Antonio, was that year of 2020? Oh, I don't know, probably more than 200. Are you you're familiar with Dr. Gemayo, Vincent Gemayo? Yeah, I, I've been under him. He said in his book, objective counsel testimony sustained. If he were to say in his book that more than 230 autopsies a year is too much and it can't be accurate, would that be true? Objective relevance, that'll be overruled. Objective hearsay, right, that'll be overruled. You can answer the question if you can answer. Yeah, I mean, that's just an arbitrary number set by the uh, uh, National Association of Medical Examiners. Yes. They don't want each ME to uh, go more, more than 250 autopsies. That's just a number. Just a number. It doesn't, you, yeah. in your opinion, does it indicate that there's not as much uh, accuracy in those kind of cases beyond that? You were your, uh, I mean, there are some officers, they have to do more than that, but I feel that it should be below that. All right, just, just one moment. Mr. Munoz, would you uh, state, are you going to have any objection to, it appears they want to enter an exhibit? Uh, I don't have an objection, Your Honor. All right, what exhibit number is that? Your Honor, De Defense exhibit number two, Your Honor. All right, any objection to defense exhibit number two? No. And for the record, what is, exactly is defense exhibit number two? It's the investigative report of the medical examiner's office and the autopsy report. All right. Defense exhibit number two is admitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. It's just the autopsy report. But for clarification, Your Honor, it is just the autopsy report here labeled as defense exhibit number two. All right. That is admitted without objection. May I approach the, the court reporter to you? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I just, just have to report you. All right, ask your next question. Just a moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, this is the second half of my exhibit that the state objected to because there were markings on it. Thank you. Still All right, you all want to label that as defense exhibit number three. State, are you going to have any objection to defense exhibit number three? Oh, this is three. Just defense exhibit number three. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. All right, and what is, for the record, what is defense exhibit number three? Defense exhibit number three is the investigative report. The one that was sent in when I cross examined stop, the doctor. Stop, counsel. My question was, what is ex uh, defense exhibit number three? The investigative report. Of Any the objection state for defense exhibit number three being admitted? No. All right, defense exhibit number three is admitted without objection. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. All right, state. Okay. Um, good morning, Dr. Cannon. Good morning. And I think we skipped introductions. You are now the uh, chief medical examiner in Nueces County, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, when did you leave Bear County? I left Bear County um, September of 2022. Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier that this was a complicated case, correct? Yes. And um, you did the autopsy and then you, you looked at other evidence and you said you collaborated with other physicians? Yes. Okay. And it, is it common in a case like Mercedes that it, it actually took a, it took a couple months to get the report back? Oh yes, yeah, because you, you have to put all the evidence in. Uh, when you don't have any uh, one big diagnosis on the day of autopsy, we need to hold on and put everything together and make sure we have everything. Okay. Now I'm just going to go through um, some of uh, the things you talked about to kind of solidify. So it, it is your testimony that the lip, uh, based on the location and um, and the, the state of it, 
that it was definitely from outside trauma, correct? Yes. Okay. Now there was some uh, question about, well, can this happen after post-mortem? Um, isn't it true that living processes that like swelling and um, temperature control, they stop when you die, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, tissue um, uh, reacts different after trauma, and I could differentiate postmodern trauma versus trauma happened before because we are experts in interpreting trauma. Okay. Um, now, you said there was no evidence of, of sexual assault. However, you did notate uh, that she had a, a dilated anus, correct? Yes, that is the outside part, um, but I didn't really know what to make of it. Okay. Um, and then you said there was no evidence of any trauma to her throat, correct? No, no trauma. And you mentioned a couple um, um, examinations for asthma. What were those? Um, first of all, when we open the airway, uh, we are going to see some like mucus or like a slimy flux obstructing the airway. I didn't see that. And also under the uh, microscopic section, I did not see evidence of asthma. Okay, so there was no, from, there was no physical evidence that she would have been having an asthma attack. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, the hyoid bone, that's something that is usually um, looked at if there's a suspicion of, say, um, suffocation by the neck, correct? Or strangulation. I should say. Yeah, strangulation, manual, we see that, and I don't think there is anything evidence of that here, no. Okay, so if, if the medical history um, and, and what witnesses have said is that um, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, would put his mouth, I mean, sorry, his hand over her mouth and his hand o over her, her nose. Objection to her staying in fact not presented. Like, that would be overruled. If if the witness has said that he would state his, he would put his hand over her mouth and hand over her nose to restrict her airways, that would not impact the hyoid bone, correct? No, that's way higher up. It will not show evidence in higher. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I just want to make this clear because this phrase terminal aspiration has been thrown at, around a lot. That means that the aspiration happened while somebody is already dying, correct? In the process of dying, yes. That's nothing to do with the cause of death. Okay. And rhabdomyolysis was something that was absolutely confirmed in Mercedes' case, correct? Yes, we confirmed it uh, by uh, microscopic evidence and we confirmed with the other doctors, multiple eyes looked at it, yes. And you testified that, that rhabdo can be caused um, when the muscles suffer trauma, but it can also be caused from extreme exertion as well, correct? Yes, it can, um, and you know, those can be corrected if taken to the hospital immediately, and whereas here it looks like it's happened over time. Yes, and independently, um, trauma, such as Mercedes, could cause rhabdo, correct? Yes, it can, yes. But then also, if you had a five-year-old, like Mercedes, who was forced to hold objects for three, four hours at a time over a, over a two or three week long period, that would also explain rhabdo as well, wouldn't it? Yes, because you're using muscles for a long period of time. It can happen, yes. So in Mercedes' case, where she has extensive injuries and there's evidence of long-term exertion of her muscles, it makes sense that she has rhabdo, doesn't it? It adds up all those scenarios. And, and you, you would agree that rhabdo um, is treatable if, if taken responsibly when they start showing symptoms, correct? Yeah, early stages, yes. However, it does pose a substantial risk of death. Well, especially in a thin individual and young child, they don't have much risk, so. Yeah. And um, when you say especially in a young child, 
What makes them more susceptible? Well, in, in medicine, young and old are similar. They don't have like a well-developed adult, so they're vulnerable to disease. So Mercedes, being a five-year-old, was more vulnerable to to being abused, basically. Well, I mean, that's that's a general statement, but okay. understood. I'll, I'll I'll retract that okay. question. Thank you. Um, now, asphyxia. Um, when someone dies of asphyxia. Um, would you consider that to be a, like a, a sudden death? Uh, it depends on the mechanism. Uh, if somebody is holding uh, the airway obstruction like nose and mouth, it, it, it still takes some effort to do that. Okay. Would you expect somebody who has asphyxia to then vomit and start talking before they die? No, I mean, if that is the cause of death, they should die as a result of that. Okay, so asphyxia would happen, and then they should die after that, without if, getting consciousness. If that is the only trauma, and then that is the end of it, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kane, and I'll pass the witness. Good Thanks. Thanks. You are, I'm sorry, doctor, I'm confusing you, but I respect you, and that's why I'm calling you your honor. <laughs> uh, uh, Mrs. Mitchell mentioned to you, she used the word absolutely determined that it was rhabdo. Would you have used that word absolutely? No, I mean, we are positive. We are positive, but that's yes, not absolutely. I, I, I wouldn't say absolutely, no. I have a hypothetical. If someone was watching and saw someone jamming food down Mercedes' throat and then Mercedes vomiting it out, trying to get rid of it, and that person were to jam a spoon down Mercedes' throat and Mercedes then fell on the floor and had no breath, would that affect you at all if that was evidence put in front of you? Your no, I mean, that mechanism doesn't sound right in this particular case. That, that doesn't fit the story. What story? Uh, oh, the findings I see in the body. But if you had been presented with that fact before you did all this, would that make a difference? Uh, well, even if it's presented, I would research into it, look into it, like I said, it sounds like a choking that which I have investigated many. Uh, we would particularly look into that, and I don't think there is any evidence of that here. There was no evidence that you searched into it either. Was that correct? I, I do not think that happened here because there was no uh, facts presented to me, and then I did not see any evidence of that. That's the point. No facts were presented to you about that. But if facts like this had been presented to you, would you have done your, your autopsy differently? No, I mean, it wouldn't be any different. Um, I would still do the same. And uh, uh, like I say, each case is different. Each scenario is different. Uh, did that really happen in the case in question? And again, it's impossible to say which muscles broke down to cause the death. No, I mean, we just say general uh, because the test doesn't say which muscle did it. It's not very precise, though, is it? Uh, no, I mean, it's not supposed to be precise. It's just to diagnose a breakdown. Why isn't it supposed to be precise? Because there's not particular uh, a stain or a test which can distinguish each muscle. The skeletal muscles in the body are all the same, so. And there's no way to quantitate. quantitate. No, we, we can't quantify it, no. It sounds very vague to me. Was it vague? I mean, it, it's a phenomenon, and it's, it's a known phenomenon, and we found evidence of it, so. But it also fits the narrative of the very badly damaged little baby's body, right? 
I'm sorry, it damaged. It fits your narrative. Uh, uh, objection argumentative, sister. Would you have been able to diagnose this as rhabdo immediately after the autopsy, or did you have to talk about it with your colleagues? No, not immediately. We had to talk about it. So you weren't able to determine immediately that rhabdo was the cause of death? No, not immediately, no. Pass the witness. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, is this witness excused? He's excused and not, not subject to the call. All right. Thank you. Uh, the rule has been broke. Uh, in both Dr. Kennedy, you're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone except for the state of the defense. Thank, Thank you for you, in. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad. You're excused. All right. Um, if you all will bring out Miss Mendoza. Yes, Your Honor. the district clerk. Uh, Judge, uh, he was here. No, well, is the district clerk in the back? It's understanding he's in the, it's in the hallway, Your Honor. All right, let's bring in the district clerk. Just one moment. And Deputy Moore, if you could check in the back to see if Tom the train is back. Yeah, thank you. swear and affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth so help you back. Thank you. Alright, you can lower your hand. Make sure you keep your voice up for members of the jury and the court reporter if you'll state your name for the record. Donnie Gonzalez. Miss Donnie, uh, my name is Teresa Collins. Good morning. Uh, can you uh, bring the records that you have for Jose Angel Ruiz and Katrina Mendoza? Your Honor, at this time the state's going to object to the relevance of this witness and to ask for a voir dire outside the presence of the jury. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to see you in the back briefly. Remember my previous instructions. Everyone, please rise to the room. Indictments or charging instruments for Jose Ruiz and Katrina Mendoza. Okay. What did you bring with you, if anything? None. Why not? There are no indictments. I'm sorry, I'm dying. What was that? There are no indictments. Are you in regard? I'm sorry. In regards to related to murder or capital murder charges. And is that the sole offense that you were requested to come and testify from? Yes. Pass the witness, Your Honor. No questions. Your Honor. So what's the relevancy? Exactly, relevancy there's no sense. relevance. It's relevant as to what they've been charged. This is a capital murder case. It's a child under 10. She's no, murdered. this is not a capital murder case. It's not charged as a capital murder case. But under Texas law, murder of a child under 10 is capital murder. And she, Ms. Donnie is, is just saying that there is no record of a charge of capital murder, or even of murder in this case. And that's relevant to my case. Your Honor, we would say that this is not relevant. Further, the witnesses or the jury knows what the indictment is. It was read to them, and defense counsel read the entirety of Ms. Mendoza's charge. They are aware that there is no murder charge, and this is not relevant. All right, state's objection uh, to this witness is going to be sustained. The court is finding that her testimony is not relevant. 
Uh, the court is basing that decision on the indictment that is uh, before the court and the indictment that was read when uh, the accused entered his plea of not guilty. In that indictment, there's no listing of a murder or capital murder. So, you're excused. All right, thank you, Ms. Farney. I'm uh, pardon? I just said thank you to Ms. Farney. Mm -hmm. All right, if you'll bring out Ms. Mendoza. Okay, can I bring the jurors out? Because she's. Yes. Okay. Bring the jurors first and I'll go get them. All right. Um, Mr. Todd McCray, where are you? Here you go. Okay. Your Honor, can we have a break, a bathroom break? Uh, a rest break, whatever you want to call it. Five minutes. Thank you. Can you let her know it's five minutes? Okay. Thank you.
right, everyone, please be seated. Uh, defense, call your next witness. State, uh, defense calls Katrina Mendoza. you're still under oath, make sure that you keep your voice up so that members of the jury and the court reporter can hear. Defense? Good morning, ma'am. January 13th. Of what year? 2022. Um, I think so, yes. Would you have sent him texts if you were living in the same house with him? Mm, yes. Do you recall a text where you were complaining about you couldn't take much more of Mercedes? Do you remember writing a text like that? Yes, probably. You remember telling him that I'm going to object to reading from items on evidence. Did you ever tell him that you were, that you made Mercedes? To, again, don't say objection. Did you ever tell him that you made Mercedes in timeout hold her arms up for two days in a row? No. Did you ever tell him that you couldn't have her with you much longer because you were afraid of what you might do? No. What was your phone number? I don't remember. Could it have been 210-551-0891? I'm not sure. Did you say it that in, at ever at any time if I I'm either gonna live with my father, stepfather or or whatever, I'm sorry, whatever he was called, and your biological father. Do you remember ever saying that to him? Can you repeat the question? Do you remember ever saying to Jose that you were gonna find a different place to live? No. That you were deciding between your your godfather and your biological father. I don't remember. Did you ever tell him that you had to get a stable place to get the children in school? Yes. So they really weren't in school in January or February of 2022. Is that correct? No, they were enrolled. They were where? They were enrolled. Where? I don't know the name of the school. Did they attend that school at all in January? I can't remember. How many children did you have? Two. Was was Mercedes in school at all? Yes. Where? I can't remember the name of the school. Was she in school or was she in a daycare? School. Was it a free school or was it a paid school? Object to relevance. Uh, it was a free, free school. 
in order to get her into that school, do you remember what address you might have used? 1106 Caspian Point. I'm sorry, 1106? Caspian Point. And where was that? In Bywater Rock and Fortin. And who lived there? Uh, my godfather, my god sister, my two little brothers, and my god sister's husband. And you too, is that right? And me and my kids, yes. So they only went to that school when you were staying at that house, is that true? Yes, ma'am. On January, January 12th, I'm sorry, 13th of 2022. Do you recall telling Jose that you held, had Mercedes hold her air, arms in the air for two days in a row? When she got up the next morning, it started two full days. Do you remember telling him that? No. So if it's in an email, it must be a mistake. I'm not sure, I don't remember saying that. You were saying that Jose beat your child to death about three weeks before her death. Do you remember that? What I meant was his uh, abuse caused her death, yes. It couldn't have been the abuse that you caused on January 13th of 2022. No. What did you do to your child that day? Do you remember? No. If you have a text, that says you did something, did you, did you lie in texts? Sometimes I would lie to Jose about what I was doing just to avoid an argument. Pass the witness. Uh, Katrina, for what purpose would you lie to Jose about what you were doing with Mercedes? Because he would get angry if I treated her a certain way, so I knew what he wanted to hear, so sometimes I would just tell him what he wanted to hear to avoid an argument or to get physical altercations or um, just, to avoid, just to avoid an argument. And what did he want to hear? That I was punishing Mercedes in any type of way. And you were living, you just testified you were living with your godfather. That's Homer, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, but on January 21st of 2022, there was an altercation and you moved out, correct? Um, yeah, around there, yes. Okay. And prior to you leaving Homer's home, Mercedes, the day before, had gone with Jose. Yes. Um. And, and there was testimony, uh, and defense asked you questions about um, that you had said that Jose had beat Mercedes three weeks prior to her death. Uh, isn't it true that you're actually meaning he beat her for the three weeks, for the three weeks prior to her death? Yes, that's exactly what Not I mean. Not just three weeks ago? Yeah. Okay. Pass the witness. Three weeks the three weeks prior to her death, you testified on my direct examination that he hadn't seen the children for two days before her death. Was that a lie? Can you ask again? You testified on my direct examination that Jose had not seen the children for two days, two full days prior to her death. Yes, that's true. It is true. Definitely didn't see them. And uh, at that point, say the third day, where were you living? I was staying with Jeanette. You're staying with Jeanette. Why, why, what kind of an altercation was it that you had uh, at your grandparents' home that you left? Um, I, we got into it because uh, Jordan was playing with one of my little brothers and 
um, I got upset for some reason. I don't remember, but I confronted my godfather, Homer, about it, and he kind of didn't want to, like, get after his son for... I think they were fighting over something, him, uh, Jordan, and my little brother. And um, I told my godfather, and he didn't really, like... He kind of just pushed it to the side. He didn't address his son about it. So I got upset, and my godfather kind of pushed me. And so... I'm sorry, you physically pushed you? Yes. Where were you when this happened? I'm going to check the relevance. Were you in his house when this happened? Yes. What part of the house? I'm going to check the relevance. You said he pushed you. He okay. took his hand and threw it against your body. Is that right? I'm going to object to relevance and ask an answer. It's the same. How did he push you? Object to relevance. It's the same. Isn't it true that the fight was really about how badly you were treating Mercedes and they had gotten sick of it? No. Isn't it true that on the 21st, when this supposedly happened, that the CPS worker had been to your house there? Object to leading. That would be all the rules. No. What day was she there? Um, I don't remember, but it wasn't the day before we left. But it was around then, wasn't it? Mm, no, about like maybe two weeks before we left. Two weeks before you left. What are we talking about in terms of time here? You left on the 21st? No, I believe I left on the 22nd. 22nd. And if the witness testified that it was the 21st of the last appointment, that would be a mistake. Is that right? I'm not sure. I don't really remember, so I could be wrong. of this testimony, you've remembered <coughs> some things very clearly and other things not at all. I'm not object to argumentative overruled. I've asked your question. Sorry. Overruled your Ask your question. Can she answer that? Or do I yeah, ask your question and she'll answer it if she can. I'm sorry, Miss Diana, would you mind reading it back? In the course of the same in the course of this testimony, remember some things very clearly and other things not at all. Thank you. Why is that? Because it's been two years. Three years? Two. Two years. And is there anything else more significant in your life than something like this that you would forget it? There's just some things that I don't remember that you don't want to answer or that you don't remember? That I don't remember. Your Honor, I'd like to uh, show the witness testimony of her daughter, Jordan. I need help with the state putting it on.
Did you ever talk to your daughter Jordan the day after Mercedes' death was announced? No. Um, I would like to get your opinion on what your daughter said about you. No objection. Objection? I'm sorry to interrupt. I thought she was dead. I'm an objector relevant. That will be sustained. If your daughter said that you were jamming food into Mercedes' mouth and Mercedes was spitting it out, would that be true? No. If Mercedes was spitting out globs of food, would that be true? No. Why were you feeding her anyway? I wasn't feeding her, she fed herself, but I had gave her food because it was time to eat. What time was it? Maybe about 1.30 to 30 o'clock in the afternoon. Was she on regular meal time? Jack to relevant. No. What food do you recall giving her at 1.30, 2.30, whatever? Well, due to the swelling of her mouth and the missing teeth that she had, I gave her soup, I gave her bananas, I gave her yogurt, I gave her water. You didn't shove it in her mouth? No. <laughs> Jordan was lying. I believe she's been coached. Who would have coached her? I'm not sure because I didn't have her right before uh, when I was in the hospital. She was not with me. Where was she? She was with Jose and Jeanette. And who would have coached her about what she said? Objection, speculation, system. The witness testified that somebody coached her. On what I'd like to ascertain is who would have coached her? I the objection has been sustained to speculation. So do you retract your statement that she was coached since it's all speculation? All right, the court makes its rulings. I have ruled that with regards to speculation, the objection is sustained. Ask your next question. I asked her, Your Honor. That will be sustained. Retract, Ask your next question. Would you retract? your statement that she was coached. Objection, argumentative, speculation, relevant. Sustained. I'd like to put that video on now, Your Honor, because of prior and consistent statements and for impeachment. It is not her statement. It's someone else's statement. That will be I'll object, Judge, so that's not proper impeachment. You're not allowed to do that. It's not, it's not proper impeachment. Was it sustained? Yes. Thank you. Pass the witness, Your Honor. No further questions, Judge. All right, is this witness excused? Yes, yes Your Honor. From the state. All right, the rule has been invoked. You're not allowed to discuss your testimony yes. with anyone. Do you understand? Yes. All right, you may step down. Is he testified? Defense, call your next witness. Your Honor, Mike, I don't believe she came. It was a pediatrician, but as far as I know, she's not here. So could you just give us a moment? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have you all step outside for five minutes. All right, for the jury. I'll remember my previous instructions.
All right, everyone, please be seated. All right, defense, call your witness. Defense calls Dr. Veronica Zamora Campos. All right, can you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will provide will be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. All right, you can lower your hand. This witness is appearing by Zoom. State any objections to the witness appearing by Zoom. No objection. Defense, any objections to the witness appearing by Zoom? No, Your Honor. Mr. Ruiz, do you have any objection to this witness appearing by Zoom? No, no. All right, if you'll state your name for the record, please. Dr. Veronica Zamora Campos. All right, defense is your witness, and please make sure everyone that you're speaking to the microphones. Doctor, you're a pediatrician, right? Yes, that's correct. And are you a member of a practice? Yes, I am. How many doctors are there? Uh, we have four providers. Currently, when did you first treat Mercedes Lasoya? I treated uh, Mercedes on September 21, 2017. Were you the first person to treat her? That is correct. And after that time, did you treat her or were other doctors in your practice treating her? The other providers treated her. If you were to treat Mercedes today, and you can't because she's dead, but if you were, would you be referring to those records before you yeah. dealt with the child? Yes, yes I would. Is that a common practice? To, re to refer to the record when we treat our patient? Yes. yes. Okay. Do your records indicate that there were appointments that the child did not show up for? Yes. Can you tell us which dates the child did not show up for appointments? Um, May 3rd, 2018. Um, September 5th, no, correction, uh, that's an error, uh, November 15th, 2018, March 5th, 2019, July 9th, 2019, April 27th, 2020, August 11th, 2020, March 10th, 2021, and July 23rd, 2021. Thank you. Do your records indicate why the child did not show up? I'm going to object. Calls for speculation and hearsay. All right. If you know, you can answer the question. Uh, no, no indication. No indication on the record why they did not show up. Thank you. Um, do you have a diagnosis in your records for the disease of asthma? Yes. And does it notice in your records when the child was first diagnosed with asthma? Mm -hmm. um, her uh, mother's history, August of 2017. 2017. So um, what, what was the regime that was uh, recommended to the parent to care for the child with asthma? In which visit? Whenever. The first time, whenever she first got instructions on how to deal with the disease. Oh, uh, according to her... I believe it was her March 28, 2018 visit that she received instructions on uh, weaving um, and her medications were initiated. So I uh, can't speak for the physician what they spoke verbally, but they um, um, they gave her uh, guidance on, on uh, when to follow up in one month. Did she show up for that visit in one month? No, but she was rescheduled. Um, she was rescheduled like three weeks later, 26 days to be exact. Did she, did she show up at that appointment? Yes, yeah, she did. Um, she did show up at that visit, and then 
But uh, she had, she usually had another um, reason for coming in. Hers was a hand, foot, mouth. She had gone to, um, one moment. Oh, she had gone to the ER. She had gone to Baptist ER for a rash. And that's when they gave her a breathing treatment. So, yeah, they did, they, they, uh, they, uh, they discussed it at those two visits. What kind of medications were prescribed, if any? Albuterol, which is a bronchodilator, that was an inhaler, and a flow vent, uh, which is an inhaled corticosteroid, as a preventative measure for asthma flare-ups. Do you know if those prescriptions were filled? No, I do not. There is, uh, if, a, if a child holds her breath with this condition, would that be a voluntary thing? More than likely, or I'm going to object. Call for speculation. All right, you can ask your question, then the court will hear your objection. Repeat the question. If a child were to hold her breath with this condition, would it be a result of asthma or just bad temper or what? Can you say? Unlikely for a two-year-old to hold her breath willingly. Are there any other specific maladies that might, Mercedes was diagnosed with? Um, oh, when I saw her specifically, it was just her speech delay that had throughout all her uh, seven provider visits. Most of them were well checked. Most of them were about her speech delays and getting referred out for early childhood intervention, speech therapy. I noticed she missed an appointment in March of the following year when she had been one year old. Up to that point, did she have all her appropriate uh, vaccinations and shocks? I'm going to object. I'm sorry, doctor. I'm going to object to relevance. Sustain. There's a diagnosis down there, and a recommend, well, not so much a diagnosis, but a recommendation that she receive cardiovascular care. Which doctor recommended that? Dr. Sedlick. That was her last uh, visit in the office, April 23rd, 2021. Is there any indication that she followed up on that with the cardiologist? We do not have records, but it's not uncommon for us not to receive the records from the specialist. Did Dr. Settler uh, describe why she was recommending cardio, cardiology treatment? For because uh, she heard a heart murmur on exam. What does that really mean? There's an extra sound extra sound between uh, your heartbeats. So like love dub, you're gonna have a sound in between or after. So it's an extra sound that we hear and we don't investigate it. Majority of them are benign, but uh, as a rule, we try to, um, uh, to be complete and refer to cardiology just to rule out any other problem. You have no further information on your file, is that correct? That is correct. Yes, the witness. See, so has no questions. All right, is this witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Judge. All right. Uh, the rule has been invoked. What that means is you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone. The only persons you're allowed to speak to are attorneys for the state of the defense. Do you understand? Yes, I do. All right. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Defense, call your next witness. Rest and close, Your Honor. All right. State, do you close? State, rest and close. Yes, Judge. All right. And defense, you close. Yes, Your Honor. Rest and close. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, all the evidence you're going to hear at this phase of the trial. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you uh, to the back. We still have a couple more things to work on the jury charge, and then I'll bring you back. Remember my previous instructions. All right, everyone, please rise for the jurors. <laughs>
right, everyone, please be seated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read to you what's entitled Charge of the Court. You do not have to memorize it. You'll have it uh, back with you when you begin your deliberations. Charge of the Court. Members of the jury, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count one of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the seventh day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count two of the indictment with the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon alleged to have been committed on or about the 28th day of January 2022 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count three of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the 21st day of January 2020 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count four of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the 23rd day of January 2022 in Bear County, Texas. Deputy Moore. The defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count five of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the first day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count six of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the second day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant, Jose Ruiz, is charged in count seven of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the third day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas. The defendant Jose Ruiz is charged in count eight of the indictment with the offense of injury to a child alleged to have been committed on or about the fifth day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas. To all of these offenses, the defendant has pleaded not guilty. One. Our law provides that a person commits the offense of injury to a child if the person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, by act or by omission, causes, the ch causes to a child, one, serious bodily injury, or two, bodily injury. Two, an omission that causes serious bodily injury to a child is conduct constituting the offense of injury to a child if the actor has assumed care custody or control of the child. For purposes of an omission that causes serious bodily injury to a child, the actor has assumed care, custody, or control if the actor has by act, words, or course of conduct acted so as to cause a reasonable person to conclude that the actor has accepted responsibility for protection, food, shelter, or medical care for a child. Three, a person commits the offense of assault if the person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causes bodily injury to another. A person commits the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon if the person commits an assault as defined above and the person uses or exhibits a deadly weapon during the commission of the assault. Four, child means a person 14 years of age or younger. Act means a bodily movement, whether voluntary or involuntary, and includes speech. Omission means failure to act. Bodily injury means physical pain, illness, or any impairment of physical condition. Serious bodily injury means bodily injury that creates a substantial risk of death or that causes death, serious permanent disfigurement, or protracted loss or impairment of the function of any bodily member or organ. Deadly weapon means anything that in the manner of its use or intended use is capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. A person acts intentionally or with intent with respect to a result of his conduct when it is his conscious objective or desire to cause the result. A person acts knowingly or with knowledge with respect to a result of his conduct when he is aware that his conduct is reasonably certain to cause the result. A person acts recklessly or is reckless with respect to the result of his conduct when he is aware of but consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur. 
The risk must be of such a nature and degree that its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the actor's standpoint. Six, the phrase on or about means that the state is not required to prove that the alleged offense happened on that exact date. But the date of the offense alleged in the indictment must be some date anterior to the presentment of the indictment and not so remote that the prosecution of the offense is barred by the statute of limitations. The statutory limitation period for the offense of injury to a child is 10 years from the 18th birthday of the victim of the offense. The statutory limitation period for the offense of aggravated assault is two years. The indictment in this case was filed on May 3rd, 2022. Seven, our law provides a person is criminally responsible as a party to an offense if the offense is committed by his own conduct or by the conduct of another for which he is criminally responsible or by both. A person is criminally responsible for an offense committed by the conduct of another if acting with intent to promote or assist the commission of the offense he solicits, encourages, directs, aids, or attempts to aid the other person to commit the offense. Each party to an offense may be charged with commission of the offense. Mere presence alone will not make a person a party to an offense. Eight, you are instructed that an accomplice witness, as the term is here and after used, means any person connected with the crime charge as a party thereto, and includes all persons who are connected with the crime as such parties by unlawful act or omission on their part, transpiring either before or during the time of the commission of the offense, and whether or not they were present and participated in the commission of the crime. You are instructed that a conviction cannot be had upon the testimony of an accomplice witness unless the jury first believes that the accomplice witness's testimony is true and that it shows the defendant is guilty of the offense charged against him. And even then, you cannot convict the defendant unless the accomplice witness's testimony is corroborated by other evidence tending to connect the defendant with the offense charged. Such corroboration is not sufficient if it merely shows the commission of the offense. It must tend to connect the defendant with its commission. The witness, Katrina Mendoza, is an accomplice as a matter of law if any offense or offenses was or were committed, and you are so instructed that you, cons you shall consider her as such and treat Katrina Mendoza as an accomplice. Therefore, you are instructed that you cannot convict the defendant, Jose Ruiz, on the testimony of Katrina Mendoza alone. You are instructed that the testimony of Katrina Mendoza must be corroborated by other evidence tending to connect the defendant with the offense committed. Moreover, you cannot convict the defendant upon the testimony of Katrina Mendoza unless you first believe that the portion of her testimony that ascribes guilt to the defendant is true and shows that the defendant is guilty as charged in the indictment. And then, as stated above, you cannot convict the defendant upon said testimony unless you further believe that there is other evidence in the case outside of the evidence of the said accomplice tending to connect the defendant with the offense committed. If you find that an offense was committed and the corroboration is not sufficient if it merely shows the commission of the offense, but it must tend to connect the defendant with its commission, and then from all of the evidence you must believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense charged against him. You are further instructed that you are required to agree unanimously on the evidence that you believe corroborates the testimony of Katrina Mendoza. You are further instructed that the state must prove the corroborating evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, and if they fail to do so, then you, not, then you cannot consider that evidence as corroborating. Nine, a person is criminally responsible if the result would not have occurred but for his conduct operating either alone or concurrently with another cause, unless the concurrent cause was clearly sufficient to produce the result and the conduct of the actor clearly insufficient. Therefore, as to each count, you cannot find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty unless you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the injuries, if any, sustained by Mercedes Lasoya, if they were, would not have occurred but for the conduct of Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza. 
so that if you believe that the conduct of another person or persons alone was a concurrent cause sufficient to cause the alleged injury sustained by Mercedes Lasoya and the conduct of Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, was clearly insufficient, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant and say by your verdict, not guilty. 10. It is a defense to the prosecution for the offense of injury to a child that the act or omission consisted of emergency medical care administered in good faith and with reasonable care by a person not licensed in the healing arts. Therefore, with regards to the allegations in paragraph A of count one, even if you unanimously find that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Jose, Jose Ruiz did intentionally or knowingly cause serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya a child who was 14 years of age or younger by a manner and means unknown to the grand jury, but you further find from the evidence that, or you have a reasonable doubt as to whether at the time he did say, did so, Jose Ruiz was administering emergency medical care in good faith and with reasonable care, then you will find in favor of Jose Ruiz on this defense. However, with regards to the allegations in paragraph A of count one, if you unanimously find that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Jose Ruiz did intentionally or knowingly cause serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger by a manner and means unknown to the grand jury, and you further find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that at the time he did so, Jose Ruiz was not administering emergency medical care in good faith and with reasonable care, then you will find against Jose Ruiz on this defense. With regards to the allegations in count three, even if you unanimously find that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Jose Ruiz did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger by striking Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose, Jose Ruiz, but you further find from the evidence that or you have a reasonable doubt as to whether at the time he did so, Jose Ruiz was administering emergency medical care in good faith and with reasonable care, then you will find in favor of Jose Ruiz on the, this defense under count three. However, with regards to the allegations in count three, if you unanimously find that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Jose Ruiz did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya a child who was 14 years of age or younger by striking Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, and you further find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that at the time he did so, Jose Ruiz was not administering emergency medical care in good faith and with reasonable care, then you will find against Jose Ruiz on this defense under count three. 11, count one, paragraph A. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the seventh day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger by a manner and means unknown to the grand jury, And you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defense of reasonable emergency medical care as instructed in paragraph 10 does not apply or paragraph b if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the seventh day of february 2022 in bear county texas the defendant jose ruiz either acting alone or together as a party with katrina mendoza did intentionally or knowingly by a mission caused serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, and Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, had assumed care, custody, or control of Mercedes Lasoya and failed to do so, and that Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, failed to seek adequate medical treatment for Mercedes Lasoya, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count one of the indictment and do not consider paragraph 12. 
if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count one of the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child in count one, and next consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child under count one as instructed in paragraph 12. 12, count one, lesser included offense, paragraph A. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the seventh day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did recklessly by act cause serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger by a manner and means unknown to the grand jury, and you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defense of reasonable emergency medical care, as instructed in paragraph 10, does not apply, or paragraph B, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the seventh day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did recklessly by omission cause serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, and Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, had assumed care, custody, or control of Mercedes Lasoya and failed to do so, and that Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, failed to seek adequate medical treatment for Mercedes Lasoya, then you will find the defendant Jose Ruiz guilty of the lesser included offense a reckless injury to a child in count one. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count one. 13, count two. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the 28th day of January, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did use or exhibit a deadly weapon, namely his hand, that in the manner of its use or intended use was capable of causing death or serious bodily injury, and Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya by covering the mouth and nose of Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon as charged in count two of the indictment. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon as charged in count two of the indictment. 14, count three. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the 21st day of January 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by striking Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, and you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defense of reasonable emergency, emergency medical care as instructed in paragraph 10 does not apply, then you will find the defendant Jose, Jose Ruiz guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count three of the indictment and do not consider paragraph 15. If you do not so believe or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count three of the indictment Say by your verdict, not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child in count three. And next, consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child under count three as instructed in paragraph 15. 15, count three, lesser included offense. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the 21st day of January, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did recklessly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by striking Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, 
and you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defense of reasonable emergency medical care as instructed in paragraph 10 does not apply, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the less included offense of reckless injury to a child in count three. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the less included offense of reckless injury to a child in count three. Sixteen, count four. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the 23rd day of January 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by pinching Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count four of the indictment and not consider paragraph 17. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count four of the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child in count four, and next consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child under count four as instructed in paragraph 17. 17, count four, lesser included offense. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the 23rd day of January, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together, as a party with Contrita Mendoza, did recklessly, by act, cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by pinching Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count four. If you do or not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count four. 18, count five. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the first day of February, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by inserting tacks into the feet of Mercedes Lasoya, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count five of the indictment and do not consider paragraph 19. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count five of the indictment, say by your verdict, not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child in count five, and next consider whether the defendant is guilty of the less included offense of reckless injury to a child under count five as instructed in paragraph 19. 19, count five, lesser included offense. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the first day of February, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did recklessly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by inserting tacks into the feet of Mercedes Lasoya, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the less included offense of reckless injury to a child in count five. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the less included offense of reckless injury to a child in count five. 20, count six. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the second day of February, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either like acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by striking Mercedes Lasoya with a belt then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count six of the indictment and do not consider paragraph 21. 
If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count six of the indictment. Say by your verdict not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child in count six. And next consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child under count six as instructed in paragraph 21. 21, count six, lesser included offense. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the second day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by striking Mercedes Lasoya with a belt, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the lesser included offense a reckless injury to a child in count six. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the less included offense of reckless injury to a child in count six. Count 22, I'm sorry, number 22, count seven. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the third day of February 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by pulling the hair of Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count seven of the indictment and do not consider paragraph 23. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count seven of the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child in count seven, and next consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child under count seven as instructed in paragraph 23. 23, count seven, lesser included offense. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the third day of February, 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger by pulling the hair of Mercedes Lasoya with the hand of Jose Ruiz, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count seven. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count seven. Number 24, count eight. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the fifth day of February, 2022, in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya a child who was 14 years of age or younger by striking Mercedes Lasoya with a cell phone, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count eight of the indictment and do not consider paragraph 25. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count eight of the indictment, say by your verdict, not guilty of the charged offense of injury to a child and count eight, and next consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child under count eight as instructed in paragraph 25. 25, count eight, lesser included offense. Now, if you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the fifth day of February, 2022 in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, either acting alone or together as a party with Katrina Mendoza, did intentionally or knowingly by act cause bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child who was 14 years of age or younger, by striking Mercedes Lasoya with a cell phone, then you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count eight. If you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt there, you will find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, not guilty of the lesser included offense of reckless injury to a child in count eight. 
You are instructed that your verdict in each count must be unanimous. If there is evidence presented of more than one alleged instance that could constitute an offense committed by the defendant against the complainant, if any, you are instructed that your verdict on each count must be unanimous about which specific instance, if any, constituted the commission of the offense in each of the individual counts. Evidence of any other alleged acts of misconduct by the defendant against the complainant in this case is not to be considered unless you believe those acts, if any, were committed beyond a reasonable doubt. With regard to those other acts, if any, you are instructed that said evidence was admitted, if it was, only for the purpose of showing the state of mind of the defendant and the complainant and the previous and subsequent relationship between the defendant and the complainant, if it does, and for no other purpose. You are instructed that under our law, that no evidence obtained by an officer or other person in violation of any provision of the Constitution or laws of the state of Texas or the Constitution or laws of the United States of America shall be admitted in evidence against the accused on the trial of any criminal case. Therefore, if you believe or have a reasonable doubt that the evidence was obtained in violation of any provisions of the Constitution or laws of the state of Texas or of the Constitution or laws of the United States of America, in such event, the jury shall disregard any such evidence so obtained. Our law provides a defendant may testify on his own behalf if he elects to do so. This, however, is a right accorded a defendant, and in the event he elects not to testify, that fact cannot be taken as a circumstance against him. In this case, the defendant has elected not to testify, and you're instructed that you cannot and must not allude or refer to that fact throughout your deliberations or take it into consideration for any purpose whatsoever as a circumstance against him. You are instructed that you must not communicate with or provide any information to anyone or receive any information from anyone by any means about this case. You may not use any electronic device or media, such as telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone, Blackberry, iPad, tablet or computer, the internet, any internet service or any text or instant messaging service or any social media platform, internet chat room, blog or website to include, but not limited to Google, Facebook, MySpace, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter or X to communicate with anyone any information or receive any information from anyone about this case or to conduct any research about this case until I accept your verdict. Written statements made by a witness to investigators or other officers or police reports made by officers and tendered by the prosecution to the defense for purposes of cross-examination are not part of the evidence unless introduced in evidence. Many times, statements and reports may be marked with an exhibit number but are neither offered nor received in evidence. I can send only statements and reports received in evidence to the jury room. You are instructed that the statements of counsel made during the course of the trial or during the argument, if not supported by evidence, or statements of law made by counsel not in harmony with the law as stated to you by the court, and these instructions are to be wholly disregarded. You must disregard any comment or statement made by the court during the trial or in these instructions which may seem to indicate an opinion with respect to any fact, item, or evidence or verdict to be reached in this case. No such indication is intended. You are instructed that the grand jury indictment is not evidence of guilt. It is the means whereby a defendant is brought to trial in a felony prosecution. It is not evidence nor can it be considered by you in passing whether this defendant is guilty or not guilty. During your deliberations in this case, you must not consider, discuss, nor relate any matters not in evidence before you. You should not consider nor mention any personal knowledge or information you may have about any fact or person connected with this case which is not shown by the evidence. You are instructed that you are not to let bias, prejudice, or sympathy play any part in reaching a verdict in this case. After argument of counsel, you will retire to the jury room, select your own presiding juror, and proceed with your deliberations. 
After you have reached a unanimous verdict, the presiding juror will certify thereto by filling in the appropriate forms attached to this charge and signing his or her name as presiding juror. You are the exclusive judges of the facts proved, of the credibility of the witnesses, and of the weight to be given the testimony, but you are bound to receive the law from the court, which is herein given to you, and be governed by that law. In order to return a verdict, each juror must agree to that verdict, but jurors have a duty to consult each other and to deliberate with a view to reaching unanimous agreement, if that can be done without violence to individual judgment. A unanimous vote means all 12 jurors must agree. Each juror must decide the case for himself, but only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with his fellow jurors. In the course of deliberations, a juror should not hesitate to re-examine his own views and change his opinion if convinced it is erroneous. However, no juror should surrender his honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of his fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. All persons are presumed to be innocent, and no person may be convicted of an offense unless each element of the offense is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that a person has been arrested, confined, or indicted for, or otherwise charged with the offense gives rise to no inference of guilt. I'm sorry, gives rise to no inference of guilt at his trial. The law does not require a defendant to prove his innocence or, prove, or produce any evidence at all. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit the defendant unless the jurors are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in the case. The prosecution has the burden of proving the defendant guilty and it must do so by proving each and every element of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt and if it fails to do so, you must acquit the defendant. It is not required that the prosecution prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. It is required that the prosecution's proof excludes all reasonable doubt concerning the defendant's guilt. In the event you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt, after considering all the evidence before you and these instructions, you will acquit him and say by your verdict not guilty. Suitable forms for your verdict are attached to the charge for your convenience if you care to use them but they are not intended to suggest to you in any way what your verdict should be, and you may or may not, as you see fit, make use of them. At any rate, your verdict must be in writing and signed by your presiding juror. Your only duty at this time is to determine whether the defendant is guilty of the indictment in this cause, and you must restrict your deliberations to the issue of whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty and nothing else. After you have retired to the jury room, no one has any authority to communicate with you except the officer who has you in charge. Do not attempt to talk to the officer or anyone else concerning any question you may have. Instead, address your questions to the court in writing. If you want to communicate with the court, notify the bailiff. Any and all communication relative to the case must be written, prepared by the presiding juror, and submitted to the court through the bailiff. Respectfully submit it. Judge Stephanie Boyd, 187 District Court, Bear County, Texas, and suitable forms are attached. Before we begin, can I have parties approach, please? <coughs> Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. First of all, I apologize for the drama on Friday and for the minor drama on jury selection when I became disoriented. I did recover from that one, but 
Friday was a disaster, and I apologize for it. What I'm asking you to consider, first of all, what if Jose wasn't home that day? Would he be in that chair right now? I think it's an interesting point. Um, Mercedes is dead. Mercedes, precious Mercedes LaSoya, five-year-old child, is dead. How did she die? The state's not worried about that. They're just worried about what happened before she died. There are plenty of charges. I won't go into all of them. I don't want to drive you crazy. You've been here long enough. I am most deeply influenced by Jordan. She had a front row seat to everything that happened. Maybe she was asleep sometimes. Basically, she was there. I don't believe she had an opportunity to be coached. She gave her statement to a social worker apparently the day after her sister was found dead. And the testimony she gave was that her mother was jamming food into her sister's mouth. Her sister was spitting it out. She kept jamming it in. And ultimately, she shoved a spoon down Mercedes' throat. At that point, Mercedes fell on the floor, according to Jordan, and she had no more breath. Jordan said that her mom tried to put breath in Mercedes, but it didn't work. I believe she said it happened twice, but it didn't work. Mercedes had no more breath. My recollection is that Jordan then said, my mom took me and Mercedes, and we went to her boyfriend's apartment somewhere in the complex. Mercedes had an opportunity to say, oh, Jose brought her back to life when we got to his place. She never said that. As far as she was concerned, her, her sister was dead when they left Jeanette's apartment. And they were in Jeanette's apartment. They weren't in Jose's apartment. Who was Jeanette? You never saw her. State never brought her. But she was there. She had been the place where Katrina had stayed with her children for two days before her death. Katrina told you that. Now, I'm telling you things that I saw, my perceptions, my beliefs. You are not required to listen to me. I'm required to tell you what I think and to hope you will go the direction that I'm trying to put you in. But you don't have to. You are the final determiner of what is truthful and what you've just seen for the past week. What did CPS, Child Protective Services, do to protect Mercedes? His name is not called Jose Protective Services. The name of the agency is Child Protective Services. Did you hear anything that indicated that they protected Mercedes, anything at all. I would suggest to you that you didn't. You heard a very fine man, Mr. Adame, report on what he saw as an investigator, but you didn't hear any testimony about, well, we're CPS and we did this or that. To my knowledge, you didn't see it. Again, it's your information, it's your beliefs that count, not what any, any lawyer tells you. And then there's the police. We had, a, we had, I believe, three neighbors that testified that they called the police because they heard a child crying in agony. Not just moaning and groaning because she didn't have a toy, but crying in pain. They heard, shot, they heard hits, they heard smacks. They called the police. With the witness, Mo, as I recall, they didn't show up. With the other witness, the couple, the woman said that they did come to the upstairs apartment, but they didn't go inside, to the best of her knowledge. They just stayed outside. I didn't hear any follow-up. It's up to you. Did you hear any follow-up by SAPD? Now, I'm not telling you that that cop should have broken in the door. In the present climate, he'd probably have been arrested if he had broken in the door. But 
could have followed up with somebody from his department the next day looking into, was the child all right? You didn't hear any evidence whatsoever that anybody checked up on Mercedes. There was another time that that neighbor called, as I recall, and she said that there was no response at all. In both cases, that neighbor was not contacted, apparently, by anybody to follow up on the story about whether the child was safe or not. Ultimately, that's really what we're talking about in this whole case. Who protected the child? The state has submitted Katrina Mendoza, the co-defendant, as the witness against Jose. Technically, there, in my opinion, only three people, pardon me, that would have the information on what actually happened. Katrina, Jose, and Jordan. The judge has instructed you cannot, cannot rely completely on the testimony or evidence produced by the accomplice. And I ask you, what was produced, except what Jordan said, other than by the accomplice? I would say everything. Everything came in from her. Was she believable? That's your decision, not mine. She called her daughter a liar. She said Jordan didn't really see her shoving food down the child's mouth. Jordan didn't really see her put a spoon in her mouth. Jordan didn't really see her fall to the floor and Jordan didn't really see her stop breathing. Jordan never used the word stop breathing. Again, what I'm saying to you is what I recall. I'm not trying to mislead you. Your statements, your thoughts and remembrance may be different than mine. It's you that count. I can't say that enough. She also said that reports from police and whatnot were wrong. An interesting thing I thought about Katrina's testimony was her memory that sometimes was crystal clear and other times she couldn't remember anything. She only had two kids. She couldn't remember what schools they went to. She couldn't remember what medicines they got. She couldn't really recognize asthma and that it's a serious disease in her child. She said, it, as I recall, that it wasn't very serious asthma. Who do you believe? Jordan or her mother. We have the detectives, Size and Dr. Detective Lawrence Size and Detective Cahill, who gave an extremely expert analysis of what they had seen. They were horrified, understandably. But they were, I believe, flawless in what they did in terms of investigation. Gustavo Cervantes was the charge nurse, as I remember him to be. He didn't see Katrina run into the hospital carrying Mercedes saying, help my baby, but he heard it. According to the charge nurse, she had no life in her. She was cold. She had no signs of life. They tried to resuscitate her. I think it was three times that they had to do it under the Glasgow rules or something, but they couldn't resuscitate her. They put an instrument in her, in her knee and various other places to try to get blood and put, put IVs in, but they weren't successful. At that point, we have Katrina, I believe, feigning an emotional situation. Detective Cahill didn't believe her at all. He thought she was faking emotion at the time. And this was right away. This wasn't days later. It was right away. If you're carrying your child into an ER, do you have to fake it? If she's not breathing? Again, your call. I suggest to you that if you believe, and I don't know what you're going to believe, so I'm covering different angles of this, but if you believe that, that Mercedes was alive when Jose saw her and that he gave her um, 
resuscitation, and I believe he said held her over his shoulder like a baby patting her, trying to clear her lungs. If you believe that, and if you believe he acted carefully and reasonably, that's a defense. It's a defense by the statute. It's not a defense by Teresa. It's a defense by the statute. Your Honor, I'm going to object to you on the statement of the law. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the law will be given to you in the charge of the court. You may continue. And five minutes, counsel. Thank you. When you look at your charge, it will explain in probably in better language than I just used because I didn't have it memorized. But if you feel that that part really did happen and that she didn't come there dead, then you find him not guilty. Katrina is going to get a benefit out of her testimony. She could get probation, which is the other term for deferred adjudication. The most she can get in jail, the most, under her plea agreement is 45 years. She can get anywhere up to 45 years. Over five, it has to be minimum five, but anywhere up to 45 years. What if she did such a good job and you convict Jose of all this stuff? What if she gets 10? What if she gets probation? Object to relevance, Your Honor. All right, that'll be overruled. Ladies and gentlemen, this is closing arguments. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. My final words to you. Nobody protected that child, that beautiful little child, when she was alive. Nobody vindicated her death. It's up to you to do that. Mercedes Lasoya was five years old. She was a five-year-old little girl. Now, unfortunately, everyone except Katrina that you saw in this trial only knew her from February 7th, 2022 and on. They can only describe her as bruised, missing hair, missing toenails, missing teeth, horrifically injured. So what do we know about her? we get from the little details. We know that the neighbors would hear her talking back. You can tell from that picture she loved her sister. She was a fighter. As Detective Lloyd said, she was a second born. Discipline, discipline is what Katrina called it. She needed more discipline, so she went to Jose. He said, hey, give her to me. I'll show her discipline. Well, discipline was abuse, but what Jose did took it to a whole other level. That abuse became cruelty, plain cruelty, torture. And this case has been emotional, it has been trying, and it's important. Down to the technicalities. Jury deliberations, you are to select a, a foreman, go through the evidence. I think we have 111 exhibits. Not everything is in evidence. It's important to understand the police reports. Things that we referred to but didn't actually admit are not gonna go back there. But you'll have multiple videos, Jordan statements, defendant's statements. That charge is enormous. It took us 45 minutes to read it. Don't get lost in the weeds. Don't overthink it. <clears throat> Honor about, this is one of the ways that people sometimes get lost. Honor about is just that. You'll see a date range from the, the counts. There's January 23rd, 2022, all the way to February 5th. Honor about simply means before the date of indictment. I know that sounds silly, but legally that's all it has to be. Do not get stuck on that. It's been proven. 
Now count one, injury to a child causing serious bodily injury. You all do not have to agree how the serious bodily injury occurred exactly. Only that Jose Ruiz was the cause, acting with Katrina Mendoza. You can say that manner and means unknown. We know he hit her. We know he made her hold heavy things, but we don't know exactly what led to the serious bodily injury. Or paragraph B, failing to seek care. Count two, we have an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And counts three to eight are injury to a child with bodily injury. Manner and means, you must be unanimous that the actions of the defendant and co-defendant, Katrina Mendoza, as a party, resulted in serious bodily injury to Mercedes. Our serious bodily injury is not one. Obviously, she has bruises all over her. She's covered in bruises. All of those bruises, either by themselves or in conjunction with the horrendous exertion that they put on this little girl, led to rhabdomyolysis, rhabdo, which led to kidney failure. And you heard that that is a substantial risk of death. And one thing defense counsel said, I'm going to repeat again, we're not here how she died. That day, that horrible day, when for some reason this defendant chose to go from northeast side of town, ignore all the hospitals up there, and drive all the way to Southwest General. We're not here to talk about how she died on that day. We know she had rhabdomyolysis, and we know that she had injuries covering her body. That injury is enough. Law of parties. If you think Katrina Mendoza is the one who did all of these things, but you think that they acted together. Remember, Katrina was the one who invited him to use physical discipline on her. Katrina was the one who would spank her, have him hold her down. They, worked, they did it together until it got to be a little too much for Katrina. Care, custody, and control. He took custody of Mercedes on January 21st, 2022. We know that even before that, the neighbors overheard Mercedes screaming, Dad, no. So they called him Dad. They were under his authority. They were under his roof. He ass assumed care, custody, and control of that child. Like I said, Rhabdomyolysis equals death if it is not treated. It is serious bodily injury. Gustavo Cervantes, Dr. Molina, Dr. Cannon all said that. Permanent disfigurement, you look at her. You look at her and see if she had permanent disfigurement. Protracted loss of a, bodily, a body member or organ. Her kidney was failed. Ag assault, deadly weapon. This is referring to the, the multiple times when Jose would put his hand over her mouth and over her nose. Yes, Katrina Mendoza talked about it. But you have to think too, Katrina Mendoza, as guilty as she is for her part in this, what she said was corroborated. Corroborated by stuff that Jordan said. Corroborated by Jose's own cell phone. Corroborated by the neighbors who clearly said that Jose, the man, was the one making those pounding noises. Injury to a child, count three. Striking with the hand. I'm asking you, go back there, that horrible video of them in the car, that was only one of three from that day. Go watch those videos. See him hit her. Look at those rings. All of these pictures are in evidence. Look at those rings. Look at the injuries. Or read the medical examiner report. You'll see multiple punctate injuries of two to three centimeter. They match up to his rings. You see his fingers in the pictures there? 
from when he knocked out her teeth. Injury to a child, pinching with the hand. He actually admitted to this in his statement. He admitted to pinching. This was the first injury that Katrina Mendoza said she saw after that first day. <sighs> Inserting tags in the feet of Mercedes. That was from his phone, from when he would watch her on a ring camera. And that diagram right there is from the medical examiner's report. All of those are holes in the bottom of her feet. Count number six, striking her with a belt. Jordan and Katrina both talked about it. Pulling her hair, I don't need to show you those pictures again, you remember. She had huge chunks of hair missing. Jordan, Jose, and Katrina, they all pulled her hair, but mostly Jose. Striking Mercedes with the phone. Now both of her hands were horribly bruised and injured, and that was from his phone. We had Detective Knox, who we put in the timestamps of the exhibits, and then Katrina came, and we gave you the pictures that corresponded it. I'm putting them together here. January 21st, 2022. This is the day that he took Mercedes. This is the day for some weird reason he decides to start filming what he's doing to her. 4.44 p.m., she's holding. She's holding that jug. 5.20, she's got an injury on her lip. 6.54 p.m is the last of three videos where he's forcing her to do this. Forcing her under threat, hitting her. Also note, her teeth are intact. January 21st, her teeth are intact, her hair is intact. The only injury you can see on her face is the one that he had just caused. January 22nd, he starts putting urine-soaked underwear in her mouth and filming it. January 25th, her hair. January 31st, 7.21 a.m., he sees her on the ring video. Maybe she wasn't supposed to be standing up. I don't know why he got mad. But six minutes later, you have the picture, and I cut out part of it. It's that horrible picture where she is bound and she is on the floor, and she is naked. 7.28 a.m., there is another shot. We did not enter it into evidence because it was so awful. Up like a crucifix, naked with clothes over her face. All within seven minutes of each other. February 2nd, 2022, he covers her in bandages, takes a picture of it. February 4th, there goes her tooth. February 5th, Katrina told you this was, the fi this was her final straw. After this, is when she finally took the girls and left. Look at her face. In such a short amount of time, she went from smiling to looking distressed. She was sick by this point. She had been overworked. Crap. She had been overworked to the point where her body was giving out. Now we know in Bear County, Texas, the defendant, Jose Ruiz, on or about February 2022, did intentionally or knowingly cause serious bodily injury to Mercedes Lasoya, a child, a five-year-old child, by manner and means unknown. And what we mean by that is that you get to decide. Was it that time that he, he had her up like this? Was it the time he made her hold the jug? Was it the countless beatings? Or was it a combination? And that gets you to guilty. Beyond a reasonable doubt, it's not defined in Texas, not required that we prove guilt beyond all doubt. You use your reason and your common sense. Three minutes. We know that's a picture of a gun. It's missing some pieces. We don't know everything. We don't know why he filmed it. We don't know why Katrina didn't loot leave sooner. We don't know everything, but we know that he hit that little girl again and again. And that little girl cried out for help, and unfortunately, she didn't get that help. But we're not here. CPS is not on trial. Police are not on trial. Jose Ruiz is on trial. Do not lose sight of that.
that man knew exactly what he was doing. You don't hit a five-year-old child and not recognize the danger in that, especially someone like Mercedes. Listen to his statement. She was fine. She was fine. She was fine. No, she wasn't. She was dying because of the serious bodily injury that he had given her with those beatings and that overwork. Now, you might have been wondering, why did we go through so much effort to give you that jail call? It didn't play very loud in court, so I wanted to end on it so that you know that he knew exactly that he caused those injuries to Mercedes. If that autopsy comes back while I'm in jail, I'm staying in jail. Because he knew what he did. This is not a reckless act. You don't do things repeatedly, recklessly. There's lesser included offenses. No, no. He hit that girl. He overworked that girl. Him and Katrina worked together in making that little girl's life hell the last two weeks. And we ask, just like defense said, let's vindicate her. Please find Jose Ruiz guilty of all counts. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask for you to uh, remain. Uh, defense and state of jail media over here, please. I'm sorry.
please be seated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's the court's understanding that you've reached a verdict in this case. Is that correct? Yes, Judge. And is that verdict unanimous? Yes. All right, the fourth person, if you would hand the uh, verdict form to Deputy Laura, please. All right, the defendant will please rise. It states, count one, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count one of the indictment. Count two reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon as charged in count two of the indictment. Count three reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count three of the indictment. Count four reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count four of the indictment. Count five reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count five of the indictment. Count six reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count six of the indictment. Count seven reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count seven of the indictment. Count eight reads, we the jury find the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count eight of the indictment. You may be seated. Would anyone wish to have the juror polled? No, Your Honor. All right. All right. We are now starting with the uh, second phase of the trial. State, do you have any opening statements? Um, I'll give a brief opening. All right. You may proceed. Thank you for your verdict. thing to look through and like I said in my closing you know it's unfortunate that he really only heard people that heard or saw Mercedes from the day she died in punishment you will hear pe you will hear from um, Uncle Rodney and and you'll hear how Jordan's doing and you'll hear what an impact this has had on Jordan and family. And at the end of it, we will be asking for life. All right, uh, defense, can you open? Yes, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm Lorraine Efren. I'm one of Jose's attorneys. You have heard chapter two of his story. Now I'm going to give you chapter one of his story. And I just ask that you stay with me, stay with us, as you hear part one of Jose Ruiz's life. Thank you. All right, uh, State, call your first witness. Your Honor, the State call, calls Rodney Edwards. Rodney Lee Edwards. State. All right, good afternoon, Rodney. Um, how were you related to Mercedes Lasoya? Um, I am married to uh, Katrina's uh, adopted sister. Angelica Edwards is my wife. And so Katrina used to stay with us on and off with the kids. Okay, um, I'm sorry, can you repeat? 
Um, you are married to... Angelica Edwards. Angelica Edwards. Correct. And Angelica is the daughter of Katrina's godfather, Homer. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, now, how long had you known her safety? Pretty much ever since she was born. She's been staying with us on and off. I saw her grow up, um, took care of her, bought her stuff. Uh, treated her pretty much like she was my own. Did you know Jordan? Correct, same as well. Okay. There was pretty much two peas in the pots. <coughs> they made me mad, but they also made me smile at the same time. So it's a child life that I was looking forward to, seeing them grow. Okay. Now, um, how close were you to Mercedes? Um, pretty close. Um, if she ever needed anything, she knew to come to me and her, <laughs> my wife, because we'll pretty much give it to her. So, like I said, she's like real close, pretty much like one of my daughters. I'll give her anything, try to bend over backwards to make her happy, make her smile. I hate to see her sad. Um. So, back in 2022, where were you living? I don't know, with my father-in-law, still at the same location, off of Caspian Point. Okay. And who else was living in the home? Um, my wife, Katrina, and the two kids, and my wife's um, two brothers, and my father-in-law. Um, how long has the living situation been that way? Um, it's been on and off. Uh, Katrina would leave uh, with her boyfriends and sometimes move in with her boyfriends and then move back in uh, when she felt on, I guess, when they weren't working out or they broke up. But she always knew she could come back home, especially with the kids. And we make sure we take care of the kids. Um, they had their own, I guess, bedroom to share with their mom. They had their pretty much own stuff. They played with their um, brother-in-laws, which is my brother-in-law's. So, I mean, it was just basically a family life. You know, we went out on weekends, go out to, um, what is it, flea market, stuff like that, because they love going to flea market with little kids and stuff like that. Uh, flea market pizza, just having a, a, fun, a fun time, family time. Okay. Um, what other children were in the household? Uh, there's only Katrina. Mercedes and the only two children was, I guess you could say, her brothers. They're like the 10, 8 and 10 now. <laughs> More than sometimes, that's for sure. She loved taking pictures of herself. I'm pretty sure she was going to think she was going to be a model. She was a fan of the camera. I guarantee you that. She just loves being herself. She's very, very outspoken, too. Very talkative. You can't tell her no without a reason why, and it has to be legit. No matter what. How would you describe her personality? Um, fun. Very questioning, like I said. Loving, always happy, playful. Um, she wants to know more than she's supposed to as a kid. Put it like that. And I kept on telling her, be a kid. It's not going to last long. You'll be the adult soon. Just be a kid and have fun. She's always talking, um, always joking around. Has a great, great humor. And just love life. Did uh, Katrina ever mention giving up her rights to Mercedes? A couple of times to my wife. Um, I knew it was a play that she was just playing along. She would never do it, but my wife always thought she would, so that's why we always did as much as we can. Pretty much for Katrina as well, because if we help Katrina, we're helping out the kids as well. So, yes. And so, um, was that, did you and your wife want to adopt Mercedes? 100%, my wife wanted to. Well, um, I don't know, but I don't think my wife can get pregnant. I've been trying. So, you know, that was the next best thing. I mean, 
she loved us, we loved her, we gave her anything, she's pretty much our second kid anyways, so. Okay. Between Jordan and Mercedes, were you closer to one of them than the other? Uh, Mercedes, Jordan's much more closer to her mom. Uh, Mercedes, she's the, I guess you would say quote unquote rebel. I wouldn't say rebel, she's like I said, very questionable. You have to give her a point, a reason why it makes sense to her, otherwise she's not gonna understand it and not gonna follow it. That's the way she was, but that's what a kid was. Her mind was still growing, developing. She was a kid. She wanted to know everything and wanted to know why. Can I may approach the boyfriends? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you what's the marked states. Exhibits 112 through 117. And you'll forgive me, I accidentally printed pictures double the side. <laughs> These are pictures of Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's see, 112 and 113. Did you take those pictures? I took this one. I think somebody else took this one. Okay. Now 116 through one, or I'm sorry, 114 through 117. Oh, she was the photo. She <laughs> was the camera lady. She took pictures of me and her. Um, I did take a picture of this one. Uh, 115, I think my wife took a picture of this one. I did take and, a picture of this one. And who's in the picture with her? And um, her sister, Jordan. They're just sitting on the bench, smiling, loving life, and letting I, the wind blow through their hairs. I see she's got a hand. Oh, hands on the hips. Like excuse I said, me, she excuse is. Excuse me. One at a time, please. Can slow down if I can, please. Come I'm sorry. In States Exhibit 115, um, how are her hands positioned? Her hands are positioned on her hips, like she's ready to tell somebody. Uh, you can't tell her nothing. States Exhibit 116, Who, who's in that picture? Uh, it is three. It is herself, her sister, and my brother-in-law, the youngest one, Jeremiah. <laughs> That's his name. Uh, he's sticking out his tongue, and they're both smiling in the camera. Okay, and 117. And 117, <laughs> she took it up herself. Just make sure you cannot talk over each other. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, 117, she took a picture of herself sticking her tongue out with a laugh. You want to may I publish? Yes. Remember her when she was five years old? Very, very much, yes. Do you uh, know how old she was there? I can't tell you how old. I know we went camping, though, because of the background. And Did you go camping a lot with her? Um, we went camping quite a lot. I love going camping. I try to go at least once a quarter. This was at the zoo. Um, oh, wait. Yeah, I believe it was at the zoo. Correct. At San Antonio Zoo. Okay. This. Who took this photo? Mercedes took that photo of me, and she made sure to take a picture. She said, look, we're going to take a picture. And I turned around, she took the picture. Okay, now this is the photo, uh, 115, that we <laughs> talked about before, with her hands on her hip. 
that's how I know it's her mostly a lot. Like I said, you can't tell her without a good reason, and she loves to be in charge. And so we like to make sure she's in charge because it makes her happy. One sixteen, he testified this is her, her brother-in-law? Correct. Well, my, uh, my brother-in-law, but yes, correct. And uh, that was when they went camping. Okay. And so, is that Jordan? That is correct. Okay. Mercedes. And then, last but not least, this is uh, 117. Like I said, she did that a lot, and there's about... 50 plus photos of her holding my phone, taking pictures like this. She really loved the camera. And then whose puppy is that? That is my dog. Her name is Indica. That's when she was a baby. She's five years old now. Does Mercedes like dogs? Love dogs. Rodney, when did you find out that Mercedes talks? I think it was two or three days after it happened, I'm not for sure. Um, we got told by her ex-boyfriend who came to the door because he was real nice. I don't know his name, but it was Katrina's ex before the subject at hand. Correct. Um, had you ever met Jose Ruiz? Personally, not really. I have met him though, but not met met. Um, only reason I met him, he was once was in the car. Your Honor, I have to get to non response. All right, that'll be sustained. Okay. Um, did you know that Mercedes <coughs> had gone to live with Jose Ruiz in his apartment? Yes. Did you have any concerns? Yes, I always have concerns. What is the relevancy of this? Um, it goes to the increasing, um, I guess, um, volatility and emotional state of Mercedes leading up to when they moved into Jose's. All right, then that's the question that needs to be asked. Your objection is the same. Okay. From mid-2021 until her, her death in February of 2022, um, did Mercedes, well, Katrina, Mercedes, and Jordan, um, did they often go and stay with Jose Ruiz? Yes, on and off. And was there a time when you felt that um, Mercedes did not like going to Jose Ruiz? I can see a difference from when she comes to when she has to go back. If she comes for a couple of days to then she has to go back over to his house. You can just tell by the emotions in the face. Okay, can you um, elaborate on that a little bit? What is different from- Well, when she got to the house, which I would say home, she was happy, happy to be back with me, my wife, her brothers, just playing around, stuff like that. But when it was time for her to go back over with her mom and her sister, she wasn't so much happy. She wanted to make sure that she was always with Jordan. But that was it, because she wasn't very happy and that she wasn't going to be able to do what she wanted to do, which is be a kid. How did her death um, impact you? I would object to the victim impact statement. <laughs> Please. I'm going to 
Yes, ma'am. My name is Lupe Torres Morin. Yes, you may. I know Mercedes Lozoya because she's my great great granddaughter. On her maternal or paternal side? Paternal. Have you met Mercedes Lozoya when she was around? I met her when she was around two years old and then um, no contact until October uh, prior to the incident. So only a couple Yes. Yes, Jordan is uh, living with me. I have adopted Jordan. And you have the, the adoption is finalized, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, it is final. Uh, did Jordan's name change in that adoption? Yes, it did. It changed to my name. Okay. And specifically, did, did any other part of her name change? Yes. Um, when we asked her if she wanted to choose a second name, she chose her sister Victoria um, because she wanted to have that special name in her heart and in her mind. So, so we named her Jordan Victoria Torres. And you said her sister Victoria. Um, did she have another sister? No, Mercedes' name, I believe, was Mercedes Victoria Lozoya. So she wanted to keep the Victoria. So, yes. She she also calls her teddy bear. Um, uh, very much. Um, at first when she came to the house, she would uh, cry a lot. Um, she would mention that she missed her sissy. Um, she cared. Yes, she has a little teddy bear that she carries with her and will not sleep without her. That she calls her bear sissy. Um, has Jordan had any negative impacts from losing her sister Mercedes? Yes, uh, a lot of negative impact, a lot of fears, um, not trusting to be around uh, men by herself. Um, she couldn't sleep by herself for a long period of time. She um, did not want to go into the bathroom by herself not want to shower by herself. There's a lot of things that have uh, impacted Jordan. All I can say is that she misses her sister very much. Her favorite color was, I believe it was blue, but she chose to be purple now because it was her sister's favorite color. You're still under oath. Yes, Judge. And if you'll restate your name for the record, please. <clears throat> My name is Detective Justin Knox. Uh, good afternoon again, Dr. Justin Knox. Good 
Good afternoon. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I would, all, I would uh, re-offer all of the evidence from guilt and innocence for the state's department. Your Honor, and again, re-urging prior objections and asking that the objections previously made be considered writing objections here. All right, that is uh, noted for the record. <coughs> Yes. Yes. I am going to show you again State's Exhibit 92. Oh. Which is 92A and 92B. These were what we previously were going through, guilt in a sense. Now, there were a number of items that we did not get to in uh, previously, correct? Correct. One item in particular is a photo. Um, If you refer to the photos that were taken on January 31st, So I'm going to show you, let's see, State's Exhibit 81 was previously discussed. Also, I believe states exhibit, here we go, 107. <clears throat> do you, again, do you see states exhibit this image in there? Yes. And what was the timestamp for this one? <clears throat> January 31st, 20, or 2022 at 728 a.m. Okay. And then we had states exhibit 81, which was not introduced, but was described in detail um, as Miss Lasoya in a, a crucifix position. What was the timestamp for that one? That is uh, <clears throat> January 31st, 2022 at 727 a.m. Okay. Was there another photo taken directly after that one? Yes, on 131-2022 at 729 a.m. So the one right before it, States Exhibit 81, what was the timestamp for that one? I'm sorry. Uh, it's 131, 2022 at 727 a.m. 727 a.m. And then this new picture that we're discussing. Is it 729 a.m.? So two minutes later. Yes. Okay. Um, what does that image appear to show? It's a close up of a naked female showing her vagina. Are there any other photos after that on that day? Without looking at all the photos, I couldn't tell you. Okay. But there's nothing in the immediate lineup? No. 
not here. chance to review the full download of Jose's phone. Yes. States 118 and 119, are these pictures consistent with the, the pictures in his phone? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I would offer states exhibit 118 and 119. Eighteen and one nineteen are the same. Okay, I'll have word. No, thank you. State call your next witness. The state restaurant. All right. Uh, defense. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, are you okay with continuing? All right. So we're going to take. Um, I'll say a 10 minute break, so I'll have you all back here at five. Uh, you're not to discuss anything related to this phase of the trial. Does everyone understand? All right, everyone, please rise for the jurors.
everyone please be seated. Uh, defense, call your witness. Your Honor, uh, defense call for Green Relief. All right. Could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. All right. You can lower your hand. State your name for the record, and please keep your voices up so that members of the jury and the court reporter can hear. Irene Bruce. He is my son. Okay. And do um, you have other children? How yes. How many other children do you have? I have seven. Okay. Do you know that she's just been convicted on all eight counts, correct? Yes. Okay. So I would like to uh, talk to you a little bit about your background and Jose's childhood. Okay. Okay. So, can you describe to me, uh, or did you witness violence in your home growing up? Yes. Can you just briefly describe what you witnessed? Oh, uh, my mom would, my dad would hit my mom. And how often did that happen? I saw it maybe like five, six times. Yes. Okay. At what age did you leave your home? I left when I was 14. After you left at age 14, did you ever return? Um, sometimes, in and out of the home. Um, would that be in your teenage years or later? Uh, my teenage years. Okay. So, uh, there was a... Uh, <coughs> Yes. I'm going to put up a family tree just to help <coughs> talk about okay. Can you see that? Yes. My parents. Okay. And who is Senado Ray? Jose Squabby. What age did you become pregnant with your first child? Seventeen. With your first child? Yes. It's Samantha, Sanaida, and Jose. And um, did you raise Samantha, Sanaida, and Jose? Yes. And where is his father? Where is Sanaida? He's in prison. Um, not really, no. Do you know how long he's in prison for? No. <clears throat> Has he been in prison? Did he go into prison before or after Jose was born? Before. And has he remained in prison throughout Jose's life? Yes. And how old is Jose? Uh, let me think. 30, 27, 28, gonna be 28. Okay. So, throughout Jose's life, has <coughs> Senado Ray remained in prison the entire time? Yes. <coughs> and what was your life like with Senado? What kind of, did you marry him? No. Were you, uh, did you live together? Yes. Okay. 
And how long did y'all live together? On and off, um, five years. Okay. And can you describe what that was like for you? It was an abusive relationship. Can you describe what kind of abuse you're talking about? He would beat me. Did, you, <coughs> did that include during times when you were pregnant? Yes. Because I already had two children, and I was by myself. And what kind of work were you doing? I didn't work. So you had concern about how you were going to support the third child? Yes. Did that cause you to consider alternatives? No, I'm trying to Yes. Okay. <coughs> and was there a time after Jose was born that you moved back in with your mother? Yes. And what happened? Um, Did she say you can stay as long as you want? We would stay there and sometimes I felt like we weren't wanted. When I moved out of my mom's house, or? Yeah, for the last time. For the last time, I was 19. Okay. I had my own place, but I would still go back and forth, back and forth. Okay, and again, three children. Correct. Okay. Did there come a time when you uh, became involved in another relationship? <coughs> yes. And who was that relationship with? Ruben. Okay. And what's Ruben's last name? Medina. Okay. So on our chart here, we have Irene Ruiz and Senado right to the left. Now we have Ruben Medina to the right. Correct? Yeah. How long were you with Ruben Medina? <laughs> About 15 years. Okay. How many children did you have with Ruben Medina? Four. Can you just uh, tell us their names and ages? Ruben, Olivia, Hannah, and Rocco. I'm sorry? Rocco. How was it with was like a year maybe. So approximately you were approximately age twenty. Mm -hmm. So at age twenty you had four children. Correct. And what was life like with Ruben at the beginning? At the beginning everything was good. And, and to be clear, did your uh Jose Sanada and 
granted also live there with you? Yes. Okay. And so did was there some change that changed the environment of your relationship in your home? There was some change, some change with Ruben? I don't believe there was a change. I was always working. Was there a time when you were together that he was injured at work, or did that happen before you were together? Um, no, it was when we were together. Okay. So, not not long after you got together, he became injured at work? No, it was like a couple of years later that he okay. got injured. Okay. And how many children did you have at that time? When I first moved in, I was... It was my three kids, and a year later, I was pregnant with Ruben. So it was a total of four. Okay. And then how far apart are Rocco, Olivia, and Hannah? Are they pretty close in ages? A year. They're each a year apart? Yes. Okay. So what, was there a change in Ruben once he became injured? Yes. Can you describe that? He would, uh, he wouldn't want to do anything. He was very um, abusive towards the kids. And he started abusing me verbally at first. He was employed one time. For how long? For, I think, a week. So, and what kind of work did you do? I worked at McDonald's first, and then after that, I did um, taxes. Okay. Okay, now during this time period, the 15 years that you were with Ruben, uh, senior, what, what's the most hourly rate of pay that you were paid, that, if you remember? No object to relevance, Your Honor. All right, that would be sustained. Can you describe the circumstances of your home? Were you the sole provider? Yes, we were poor. Did that sometimes result in hunger in the home? Sometimes, yeah. And you mentioned that Ruben Sr. was abusive to the kids. Yes. Did you, were there some particular circumstances with regard to Jose? Yes. What, what was Ruben Sr. and Jose's relationship like? When I saw it, it was fine. I saw it was fine, but then... Well, did, was there a time when Jose was hospitalized as a toddler? Yes. And how long was he in the hospital for? About two to three months. Um, were his injuries internal injuries? Yes. Did you, did Ruben give you some explanation for how that happened? He told me that he had... Did Ruby give you an explanation at the time as to how that happened? Yes, yes. He fell off the bed. Okay. Just yes or no. Um, did you later discover that there was actually something else that caused those injuries by Ruben? Correct. Okay. And what was the uh, the severity of his injuries were, were they life threatening? 
Yes. You were working at this time? Yes. How many hours a week do you think you were working? An object to relevance, your It's the same. Did your time you spent at work impact your relation, your time with your children? Yes. Yes, he fell off a bike and he hit his head. Okay. Did that uh, <coughs> result in a concussion? Correct. And did, did it require him to go to the hospital? Yes. And that was at age 12? Yes. And did, how many times did you observe Reuben, if you did, hit Jose in the head? A couple of times. And did you observe that to be hard? A hard hit? Yes. And is it fair that to say Ruben was hitting Jose in the head all through his childhood? Yes. Yes, we did. Do you do you recall do you recall what school district you went to school in? Um, S A I S D. Just if you do, can you tell us the schools you remember him attending? No object to relevance. Not the overruled. Um Do you remember an elementary school? Um, yes, it was Carol. Remember middle school? It was Martin Luther King and Davis. Okay, and then what about high school? He went to John Jay. Okay. Did he graduate high school? Yes. Did he walk the stage? Yes. Um, what was your relationship like with Jose? You're my rock. <coughs> <coughs> Just a lot of love. <coughs> a lot of hugging and caring. Always looking up for me. <coughs> Always a jokester. He loves them. Of course, there was always bickering, but playing around. Well, how many bedrooms did you have in your home? We had three. And how many bathrooms? Uh, two. And that was for nine people? Correct. Yes. Do you remember if CPS responded? Yes. All right, could you repeat the question, please? Do you remember if CPS responded? Yes. All right, that'll be overruled. Did you, were your children removed? From Reuben, yes. Okay. 
as a result of that investigation? Correct. Okay. And did that, did, did he, like, Ruben later come back into the picture? Correct. You know this jury has convicted him on eight counts of her horrific acts. Yes. Do you know another side of Jose? Yes. Do you think the violence and abuse he experienced as a child had it has had an impact on him? I'm going to judge speculation in my personal knowledge and my expertise of your system. Um, he witnessed and was a victim of a lot of abuse. Correct. And did Ruben have particular feelings for Jose? <coughs> I don't think he cared for it. Did you observe Ruben to be especially hard on the day? Yes. I pass it to Mr. Sanchez. Thank you, Judge. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Ruiz. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. If I speak too fast, please let me know, or if you don't understand the question, Sometimes. Okay. But he's a loving son. He gets along with his siblings and with you. Yes. Okay. What do you mean by sometimes? Because he knows the difference between right and wrong. Doesn't everybody know the difference between right and wrong? Okay. So he does know the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you, said, you said that you were a victim of violence yourself, correct? Yes. Did you beat your children? No. Okay. It was discipline, but not beating. Okay. What did you see Ruben do to Jose specifically? Hit him with the cane on his head. What else? Just spank him. Okay. So these are life, and he did have life threatening injuries at some point. When he was a child, yes. Okay. As a result of Ruben? Correct. What would you, I know you got back with him eventually, but what would you have wanted to see happen to somebody who had put, given your child life-sustaining injuries, or life-threatening injuries? Yeah. How would that be overruled? I thought it can change him the same way my son thought he can change Katrina. Okay. Um, was yours, was Jose ever violent? No. Did you ever see Ruben put thumbtacks in Jose's feet? No. Do you know why Jose would put thumbtacks in a five-year-old child's feet and take pictures of it? I don't know if he did that. Okay, there it has been. They, he's been convicted of it, ma'am, and there was evidence that on his phone. Everybody has, has their own opinion, ma'am. Okay. Did he ever put, did Ruben ever put urine in Jose's mouth? No. That Did I know. ever smear dog feces on his face? I don't know. Did he ever make him kneel in a corner bound to a pole with his arms tied to it? That I don't know. He would make him kneel. Did he ever make him kneel on rice? I believe so.
Samantha Ray. I'm thirty. He's my brother. Yes, we were close. We are close. Um, and what kind of brother was he? He's a good brother. And uh, you lived in the home uh, that your mom described. The yes, ma'am. Correct. correct. Okay. Was Reuben abusive? Yes, ma'am. With his cane, his fist, um, his sandal, just anything he had, he would. Did you ever observe Jose to have a, kind of a physical reaction to that? Um, he would get dizzy. Okay. Um, do you remember if he ever passed out? I think a couple times we all did. And how often did you see that happen? A lot. Like daily, weekly? Monthly? It was daily. And so can you describe what uh, Ruben was, was he a stay-at-home parent, if you will? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. And what, uh, was he under the influences of drugs or alcohol? A minute. I'm sorry, I'm not object I know he was on medication. So. Do you remember what he was on medication for? For his back. Did you see uh, bruises on his hand? Yes. Did Ruben have a particular thing he did with your hair, with Jose's hair? With mine or my brother's? Well, let's talk about Jose's. Um, not my brother, no. Did he, do you remember him shaving their heads forcefully? Oh, um, yeah, that I do. And were there stairs in, in your home or in your apartment complex? Where were there? Uh, in our house. Okay. And did Ruben do anything with the stairs? Yes, he would push us down. <coughs> and did Ruben act a particular way to Jose? Yes. In what way? Uh, he didn't like him. He, I mean, it was with all of us, but he would constantly, like I said, hit all, all of us. Yeah. Well, did he... Um, compared to what everyone else got, what did Jose get? Um, we pretty much got all the same thing, but it was always towards my, my brother always got more more of it. I got, um, yeah. Jose got more. Yeah. And what kinds of 
discipline, if you will, that Ruben used on Jose? Um, he would put him in the corner. He, um, Can you describe what that was like? Um, Um, we were sitting, he was sitting in the corner for hours. <clears throat> yeah, so. Um, I don't know. Uh, in a chair? No, on her knees. Okay. And was there anything on the floor when you, when he was on, in the corner on his knees? Um, not, not that I could remember. Um, well, did he put pillows down? to make it more comfortable? No, ma'am. Did he put things down to make it less comfortable? No, it was just the knees. Okay. And um, where else would he have Jose do in the corner? Um, sometimes I had to carry things. He had to carry things. Like what? Um, like, just heavy stuff, like, um, like a, um, like a weight, I think, if I can remember. And what would uh, Ruben do if, say, for example, Jose tries to put something down? Um... He sometimes wasn't there. He would just leave us in the corner, and he would just go off back to sleep. So really, when we got up, it was we got up. But if not, if we got caught, we'd get, we'll, we'll get hit. He'll get hit. Okay. What about food? Did Ruben deprive you? Well, your, your mom, what hours did your mom work? Do you remember? She was at work, like day and night. She was always at work. I don't remember the exact times, but it was just always work. Okay. So when your mom was at work, Ruben was the only person watching y'all? Yes. Okay. And um, did, did Ruben, what did Ruben do about food in the home? Um, he would keep food from us. I, um, he would hide food, so if we get it, got in trouble for it. Did he ever eat in front of you or in the same without letting you eat anything? Yeah, yes. Do you remember if he walked the food away from you, from you and your brother and sisters? If he what? If he walked food away. Locked food away? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, Ruben hit Jose with a cane or other objects almost every day. Correct. And in addition to seeing times when Jose uh, got dizzy or passed out, were there other physical indications of the abuse on uh, Jose's head? Um, I don't understand. Well, did you, when he hit, for example, hit Jose in the head, mm -hmm. was there, did something happen to his head that you remember? And they get big old knots. <clears throat> Do you remember an incident with Ruben, a senior, and Jose in the bathtub? Mm, no, but I heard, they heard the story. I'm going to object to anything on, but she doesn't have personal knowledge. <clears throat> right, you answer your next question. Thank you. Um, did you observe Ruben to be violent towards your mother? Yes. And what about your mother? Was your mother, what was your mother's mental state during these years? I'm going to object to speculation or relevance. She's fine. Do you remember uh, seeing violence Ruben towards your mom? Yes. And what about your mom towards Ruben? No. <laughs> Would how how bad would that violence between Ruben and your mom again? 
It was bad. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many times did you recall CPS being called? Mm, I remember about three times. And do you remember what happened when CPS was involved? Like, yeah. Did you stay in the home or were you moved in the home? We stayed in the home. All three of those times? Yes. And your relationship with Jose, have y'all close? Yeah, we have our arguments like every sibling does, but yeah. Well, did you have particular feelings about his relationship with Katrina? Yes. Yeah. How many times did you see Mercedes? I only saw her. I hardly ever saw her. I was I lived on my own with my husband. Um, I saw her one time on New Year's. After New Year's, I saw her about like two more times. That was about it. Um, and were your brothers close with Jose? Yes. And do you have, you have children of your own? Yes, mom, I do. Three. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, what is your children's uh, interaction with Jose that you have observed? They love him. Um, Isn't it that you just mentioned that the, the couple times that you saw Mercedes, you said that you saw her after New Year's? What? I saw her on New Year's. On New Year's. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, what year was that? Um, last year, I believe it was last year. Or, no, not, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know. Okay, so if she died on February 7th of 2022, was it, was it the New Year's right before that? Or yes, ma'am. And so you didn't see her after New Year's Day or Eve? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, and you said that you have three kids of your own? Yes, I do. Um, just what are their age ranges? Um, seven, five, and four. Okay. And do you treat your kids the way Ruben treated you and your siblings? Your no, ma'am, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I would ask her, where is she? Um, All right, the answer to that question is either yes or no. Sorry. You need to listen to the question and only answer what's asked. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right, ask your question. <clears throat> Do you remember having conversations with Katrina about Mercedes? Yes. Do you remember whether Katrina expressed having a close bond with Mercedes or not having any bond? No I'm bond. Gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to object to leading and hearsay. Sustain. Do you remember the kind of relationship that Katrina described to you between her and Mercedes? I'm going to object to hearsay. That's either yes or no. Yes. Ask your next question. Did, 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 did Katrina express to you that different feelings towards Mercedes than Jordan? Yes. Excuse me. When an objection is raised, you need to stop talking. Yes. And then I'll make a ruling on that. Yes. Your objection is the same. Next question. Okay. Um, did you observe Katrina to interact with Mercedes? No. Okay. With Jordan? Sometimes. I have no further questions. Sorry, you may step down. 
call your next witness. Uh, jurors, are you all okay with continuing? Yeah. All right, call your next witness.
please be seated. And defense, you wanted to recall a witness? Yes, I recall Irene Ruiz, Your Honor. All right, you're still under oath, defense. Ms. Ruiz, has Jose ever been convicted of a felony before? No. No questions, Your Honor. All right, you may step down. Defense, call your next witness. Your Honor, defense calls Dr. John Matthew Fagan. All right, could you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I swear. All right, you can lower your hand. State, any objections to this witness appearing by Zoom? No objection, Your Honor. Defense, any objections to this witness appearing by Zoom? No, Your Honor. Mr. Ruiz, any objection to this witness appearing by Zoom? No, ma'am. All right, if you'll state your name for the record, please. Sure, it's John Matthew Fagan. State, I'm sorry, defense. Thank you, sir. Dr. Fagan, what do you do for a living? I practice as a forensic psychologist and neuropsychologist. Do you regularly practice in San Antonio? I do. In your practice as a psychologist, can you be a little bit more specific about what you do and what your specialties are? Sure, so I was trained as a clinical psychologist to assess and treat psychiatric and mental disorders, and I especially trained in forensic psychology, in which I assess folks and their mental health issues, psychiatric disorders, and then apply the assessments to legal questions for the courts. And then as a neuropsychologist, I evaluate individuals who may have neurological disorders in addition to psychiatric disorders. Okay, your specialties in psychology and neuropsychology are clinical and forensic. Is that correct? That is correct, as a psychologist and a neuropsychologist, yes. Have you ever treated Jose Ruiz? I do occasionally, more when I was in training. It's more assessment, though. Okay, but you're not, in this case, you're not a treating psychologist, correct? No, I'm not. And are there any further specialties within those fields that you described? No, I've worked with children, adolescents, and adults, typically for court systems, and it is usually within criminal courts. Also, I do a fair amount of civil litigation and then family law as well. And I work a lot with the FAA, so I evaluate pilots and air traffic control for psychological and neuropsychological examinations. What is your educational background? Briefly, I have a bachelor's degree in political science, psychology, and that was from the University of Cincinnati. I have a master's degree in general psychology from the same university. A master's degree in clinical psychology and a doctorate in clinical psychology from Chicago School of Professional Psychology. I have a Juris Doctorate from Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and I have postdoctorate certification in clinical neuropsychology through the Fielding Graduate Institute, and then fellowship training in clinical neuropsychology from the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. You don't practice, do you practice law? No, no, I tortured myself through law school to have the degree. I had a specializing training in psychiatry and law through Case Western Reserve Law School during my law school. Can you summarize for us your work experience you say is forensic in clinical psychology? Sure, so in graduate school, I really learned how to assess and treat mental health and psychiatric disorders through Cook County Jail and then the Federal Bureau of Prisons and both in Chicago. And then I'm originally from Ohio, so I did a residency through one of the court psychiatric clinics that was affiliated with the medical school there. It was called the Court Diagnostic and Treatment Center, and that's where 
I learned how to really assess defendants, not only pertaining to mental illness, but uh, relevant to legal and forensic issues that courts, judges, uh, lawyers may, may ask of me to do. Um, after that, then I had a number of years. Um, I, I had been licensed as a psychologist for about 24 years, and I can briefly run through my work experience if, if you wish. Yeah, so I did, and I'm board certified in forensic psychology, and essentially, I was a director of a court psychiatric clinic in Ohio, and I worked with four of them. So three were adult, and one was a juvenile facility. And then I worked at the, uh, I was a staff forensic psychologist at the Minnesota Security Hospital, which is the state's maximum security forensic state hospital. And that's when I then shifted gears a bit to trained to become a neuropsychologist as well. In the last nine or 10 years, I've been um, residing and doing most of my work, um, I would say between you know, Austin and San Antonio and, and Houston, uh, working uh, within the uh, criminal justice system and you know, essentially as a court psychologist and a, and a neuropsychologist doing examinations for pre-trial and pre-sentence uh, for purposes. Yes. Have you ever testified for the state of Texas in criminal proceedings? Yes, and, and for the courts as well. What do you mean for the courts as well? Well, the, the court may um, order a, a hearing on a particular issue, and I'll testify. Um, typically, the evaluations I do, a lot of them, or the majority of them, are, are referred by the courts or judges and the court coordinators. Yes, I am. Um, in your, as you have one, more than one board certification, or can you just yes, okay. so I'm board certified in clinical and forensic psychology. Fellowship trained in clinical neuropsychology. Yes, I evaluated him on a few different occasions, yes. And was that a result of my request? It was, yes. And um, without telling us what they are, um, we're going to go into that more, but do you have some opinions that you're going to be offering today? I'm sorry, you say do I have opinions in this case? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I, I do. I, I, I heard much of the testimony and, and tried to follow the trial um, when I could. Were, were you able to listen to the testimony this afternoon from Mr. Ruiz's family members? Yes, that I was. And what were the kinds of evaluations you did in this well, I, I conducted psychological and neuropsychological evaluations uh, with your client. And was the purpose of that for mitigation and punishment? Yes. And can you explain a little bit about what uh, mitigations? 
Sure. Um, looking at any information about you know the defendant, his history um, that could be relevant to the the jury when when they deliberate as to not only the nature of his offense but his his life, his makeup, anything really about him. So you know that could be any type of fact that they find would be relevant you know, to consider when, when they're sentencing him. Now, mitigation, mitigating evidence may, you know, could affect their, their sentencing, but really my, my job here is to, you know, based on your referral question, uh, forensic legal referral question, is to assess him to provide as much information to you and, you know, try to fact the, the jury uh, and best understanding him uh, when they do, you know, consider the punishment ranges. Um, were there some points, or bright line points that stood out to you with regard to Mr. Ruiz? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, you know, this is an interesting case. It, it, and look at, I guess, the just dichotomy of, of nature and, and nurture in this case. Um, you know, the facts of his biological father, uh, his stepfather, um, the way he was raised, some of his mental health and uh, neuropsychological issues that are, you know, innate to him, and how he functions, and and how all that may may lead us here um, with with the tragedy in this case. And you're not an advocate for Mr. Ruiz, are you? No, I, I am an advocate for my assessment, my data, and I'm trying to be objective in, in this case and try to answer as much, any questions that I have from your side, you're, you're really his advocate in this case. So, how many times did you meet with Mr. Ruiz? I uh, met three times. I spent a lot of time interviewing him and just talking about his background history, um, any psychiatric symptoms he may have. And then, you know, I did a number of tests uh, regarding, you know, how he functions psychologically, um, cognitively. And the cognitive tests, the neuropsychological tests were, were done more so as to, um, you know, I concerns he wasn't all that verbal with me. Uh, it wasn't a depth, a lot of depth of the conversation. Um, well, and also some concussions he's had as well. Okay, so what, what did you do on your first meeting with Mr. Ruiz? Uh, well, we spent a lot of time talking about his history and you know, he shared with me information about his life. Did you I, I can. And then we did some testing. Okay, I'm sorry. So the, the first time you met with him was interviewing some testing. Yeah. Did you and then basically most of the evaluations would be a combination of that. Okay. Well, excuse me, just hold on. Could I have defense approach briefly, please? And say.
ladies and gentlemen, just one moment. There was another witness, and I'm trying to make sure that things are still running. Uh, yes, I did. I interviewed his his mother, um, his sister, and his brother as well. Okay. And can you tell us what you Sure. So, yeah, briefly, I administered him some different cognitive tests, so um, academic achievement was basically reading, writing, spelling, um, he was reading around the seventh grade level, mathematics was, was low at fifth grade, and spelling was around the tenth grade level. His full-scale IQ um, was an 89, which places him right at the below average range. And the concern I had was more of a verbal comprehension uh, language uh, issue within a score of 80 versus perceptual reasoning, uh, a score of, of 105. So it's a 25 point difference between verbal skills and perceptual reasoning skills okay uh, sometimes let me let me just stop you there because it's a, mm -hmm. a lot of information so you you did if i may summarize and tell me if i'm correct you did some testing with regard to iq and intellectual function yes right you did some testing with regard to uh reading mathematics and comprehension academic testing yes academic testing and uh Well, right, so we look at intelligence in much part as verbal comprehension um, and as a way of our world, their language skills, uh, verbal abstract reasoning skills, social comprehension, judgment, um, vocabulary, knowledge of words, meanings, and <clears throat> he struggled in, in some of those areas, and actually all of, all of them. So he, you know, had deficits with verbal skills and comprehension. That's part of our IQ. When we're doing spatial relations, perceptual reasoning, that's more about how he can, you know, um, perceive his environment, work through blocks, designs, puzzles with no verbal component. So sometimes, when, you know, we often see gaps with lower verbal, higher perceptual reasoning skills. Now that um, may indicate a language-based learning disorder. Now, I did not see a learning disability by history in the records, but I didn't see school testing that was done. So, um, but with me, that came to be, um, you know, a, a concern of mine. Okay, so the concern with, would be with regard to uh, comprehension, oral comprehension, and reading comprehension? Well, no, be more verbal comprehension again. Um, verbal abstract reasoning abilities and in, in, in what way or an enemy and a friend like, let's say. Uh, knowledge um, of general information, kind of, you know, um, of jeopardy knowledge. You know, um, who was the President of the United States during the Civil War, let's say, is one of the questions. 
and also just social um, judgment, uh, comprehension. Uh, you know, uh, give me some reasons why it's important to enjoy your job or study history or explore outer space. So um, there, there were some verbal comprehension deficits that I saw. I did, um, and so, some of the neuropsychological testing and cognitive testing in different areas of functioning were um, were a bit inconsistent, but I, I would say that he had some deficits with processing um, and reaction time in some of his testing, and um, that, that could be related to different conditions. Um, but he also demonstrated um, some executive functioning deficits that were based on, um, I would say, disinhibition or impulse control or impulsive decision making. And those, those were some other findings that I had. Okay, um, so and then there was also, I'm sorry. Okay. He also had some, uh, you know, he was given psychological, administered psychological testing, and I found that there were symptoms related to um, depression and uh, PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder. Um, it, it was to his functioning now. Well, yeah, right. I'm, I'm assessing his functioning now, not two or ten years ago. And so what it, I told you, you know, the, the impairments were in verbal comprehension. Some of it was in reaction time, processing speed, and uh, executive functioning related to impulsivity, uh, what we call disinhibition. Sure. So, it is my opinion that there was evidence of another specified trauma and stressor related disorder, and that means he has evidence of some symptoms of PTSD. Uh, in my opinion, he doesn't fully qualify because there's a numbing and avoidance effect with him, meaning he avoids the thoughts and feelings related to prior traumatic events. And when people do that, often males, uh, you know, they're not endorsing a number of the PTSD symptoms. Uh, but in my opinion, there was enough to uh, warrant a other specified trauma and stress-related disorder. And similarly with depression, so I have a depressive disorder also in my opinion, call it an unspecified neurodevelopmental disorder. I think there are language, verbal comprehension deficits, um, but I don't have special education records uh, with a history of that. Um, and then also, there's evidence of an unspecified neurocognitive disorder, which means he has some neurocognitive deficits um, that could be due to concussions. All I'm saying is that they're valid impairments that were found in testing, and that you know his brain doesn't uh, you know function correctly in all the areas of testing, and the executive functioning has to do at times you know with problem solving, planning, impulse control, let's say, and then he has cannabis and Xanax use disorders as well. So there's a chemical dependency condition. Okay. Tell us, in addition to the testing you conducted and the results you saw from that, and um, the interviews you conducted with family members, what were the other things you reviewed in connection with this case? Well, 
I, I reviewed um, some, some appellate uh, case law that had to do with his father, okay. biological father. And I you know, interviewed family members. I reviewed some of the CPS records of different family members. I reviewed his medical records uh, as a newborn young child toddler. Did you review, for example, the arrest warrant in this case? Yes, I did. I'm aware of what the jury convicted Mr. Ruiz on. So, going, can we talk about this nature versus nurture thing? Can sure. you explain to the jury <coughs> what we mean when we talk about nature? Did yes. We, so essentially we're looking at you know, some genetic foundation which we get traits from both parents, physical, mental traits, predispositions. Uh, we may, you know, predispositions you know, for good conditions or bad, diseases, psychiatric conditions. So really our genetic makeup is, is our nature from you know, our parents. And so that's how, in part, we're formed, right? And then nurture is really our environment. And I think, you know, there's a combination of those and how they impact individuals. So the environmental factors, social, cultural, the neighborhood, um, you know, they really are also involved with shaping one's, you know, cognitive, emotional, social being, the personality, uh, in much way how they function. So it is a, a fusion of, of nature and nurture. And in this case, um, I would, you know, agree that there are certainly relevant factors that I became aware of. Um, well, with regard, that, with regard to yeah. factors you became aware of with regard to the nature of the genetic predisposition, the familial tree, biological tree, correct? Right. And then nurture with regard to home environment and childhood experiences, like experiences, interactions within the home, that with regard to the nurture, you had a chance to see both of these at play here. Would you say that? Yeah, yeah, there, there were certainly concerns. Okay. Uh, what were the concerns with regard to Well, I, I, it's my understanding his biological father, Senator Ray, was involved in sexual homicide and was convicted of murder. And he really did not have interaction with him. And then his adopted father, there was profound physical and emotional abuse, as you heard. You're talking with Ruben. To Ruben, so now we're talking about the environmental Nature yes. Part of it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, there were, go ahead. I'm sorry. Right, and, and there was also, you know, we have, I believe his sister, Shanida, had major um, CBS involvement with abuse and child abuse. And with that, that sort of substantiates that there were concerns under the nature column and concerns under the nurture column, correct? Yes, I, I would agree. And, and I know um, with, with mother, there was, can't say that there was abuse, but I, I, I had concerns there of, of neglect to, you know, it was a, in, in this case, um, there was more evidence of physical emotional abuse by, you know, Ruben as a stepfather. <coughs> the uh, abuse uh, with regard to Ruben as stepfather, um, did it give you minor concerns or major concerns? Um, ma no, major concerns. I mean, in, in psychology, you know, we have social learning theory and it's, you know, we do what we see. And, you know, the, the research um, in our field, social science research will 
you know, demonstrate that individuals who have been abused in offspring are more likely to perpetrate uh, <laughs> abuse when they become older. Now, it's not every, and it's correlated, but not always causative, because there are certain people that, you know, may be abused that don't abuse or perpetrate when they get older. But your risk is elevated. And so, <clears throat> in part, that's what we're talking about today, is, 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 is risk, is risk in this case, and then really a lack of, of protection. Uh, I don't think it was really until I evaluated him that he ever had a mental health evaluation. Um, can you repeat that? Did it seem like Jose was well protected from abuse during his childhood? <clears throat> no, um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that mom was working or kind of police it somehow. He had mentioned to me um, that he saw his mother, I think, attempt suicide when he was age 15. Um, you know, she didn't get through this unscathed. So, I think there's a, you know, there's a combination of, of the physical, emotional abuse chaos, even a little socioeconomic status, um, and, and mom's difficulties with uh, relationships and protecting her kids, certainly. So, would, is there, would you describe what's going on here with Jose somewhat generational? You see it through generations, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I heard the mother talk about, I mean, her, some of her childhood. So yeah, it is. And, but we also, I think, have his brother Ruben as, you know, criminal history as well. And so there's CPS involved in criminal history. There's a lot of that in the family. And I, in my opinion, certainly it's due to combination of, of nature and nurture. Um, and how would, did you, you said you diagnosed him with PTSD? Um, what symptoms of, yes. Okay, what caused you to, to feel the death of life? Sure. Well, you know, I, I have, let's say, medical records from when he was, I think, one and a half years of age that describe um, some major injuries. There's burning and major injuries, different areas of his body, shoulder, you know. Um, and I, I know he's not going to be able to remember that, okay, or I think mom talked about him being in the hospital for two or three months during this period, but he's been told about it, certainly. And then, you know, he witnessed domestic violence to his mom and to his sister, and he experienced it. So we're looking at what we call polytrauma or polyvictimization, meaning now we've got a couple different types of trauma within the family. And, and really the rule of thumb is the more the worse. And so, and, and the earlier the worse. So when we're looking at PTSD, that's a psychiatric diagnosis where a person needs to have been exposed, witnessed, experienced, heard of traumatic events. And then that person will have psychological symptoms from that trauma or traumatic experiences. And in this case, like like many males I evaluate, you know, they don't deal with it. And that's where you get in more in that self-medication where he really was using cannabis and Xanax just to kind of numb himself. And that's where I what I saw with him, where he was not he was not on substances, but there was an, 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 just an emotional numbness to him where he was not too in depth with his emotions or feelings, despite this type of chaotic childhood. And you know, that's 
normal, certainly in the criminal justice system, and especially when I'm the first person that's, I think, ever evaluated him. When you talk about polytrauma and polyvictimization, is, is that complex trauma? Am I getting those confused, or are they interchangeable? That's a, that's a good question. So complex trauma is really more evidence of severe trauma, and that's often within the family interpersonal mom, dad, child. And it could be sexual, physical, emotional abuse or combination. And it can affect the child in that often it's severe or it's you know severe intense, but it's also often happens early. And it can be chronic, frequent and chronic lasting long period. But it's also close and that's the interpersonal piece where, you know, your, it's your, your parent, okay? And it can have a number of effects on, on the person, uh, psychologically, emotionally, even socially, and um, as how far even interpersonal relationships in pulse control, how they view the world. So, you know, it, it's certainly a, a negative factor adverse child experience, childhood experience. And would you uh, say that Jose suffered from complex trauma? I, I would agree with that, yes. And you, you mentioned something about a numbing effect or a flat affect. Um, is that something, so we're talking, we're talking about emotional distance, emotional disconnect? Yes, we are. So one of the symptoms of PTSD is avoidance, avoidance of thoughts, feelings, or avoidance of people, places, situations, events, anything that is reminiscent or may remind you of your traumatic experiences. And it makes sense, right? Like, who wants to deal with their trauma or their skeletons? But when you don't, it, it festers and nobody wants to feel it so they're repress it. Substances help a lot with that, but it becomes more of like a symptom of just emotional numbing and avoidance. And that's, that's really when I, when I saw it become very normalized. And I think that's how then we get into what happened here. So that was something you observed with other family members as well. This, this numbing yeah. flat affect. I, I would agree. There's, there's often a lack of insight into it, a lack of understanding that comes with often in most socioeconomic households. Um, they, it's also, like you said, intergenerational. So folks, they may experience it. It may be awful, but it's really what they know and it's normalized. Okay, so if you experience abuse and neglect in your home, that can become a normalized to you, correct? Yeah, I mean, you, you often don't know how dysfunctional, harmful it is. Because it's always and, and that's where, and by the way, that's where the social learning theory is, where we're more likely to model, you know, our, our parents. We are, again, more likely to copy what they do, even if it's dysfunctional. And um, does it, how does the, con, the concussions, do you, do you think concussions in, or in childhood and a developing brain, do you think that that has some significance on adult neurological functioning? I, I think that, you know, the childhood concussions, yes, pediatric head injuries, uh, especially before 13 years of age can have more of a significant effect. 
the trauma, just the emotional trauma, the abuse, also neglect, can have uh, certainly can have a significant effect on brain development. So, with regard to Jose, with regard uh, with regard to neurological development, what were the things that you do to significant and impacting his neurological?
everyone, please be seated. And defense, it's your witness. <laughs> Well, as you heard from the other witnesses, there there was witnessing of domestic violence by stepfather to mother, but there was also physical abuse he had shared with me, that there was beatings about every day. Uh, there was use of belts, tree branches, Was they shared with me. And would the, those be the kinds of things that you would expect to see post-traumatic stress disorder result from? Certainly. Um, and you mentioned the term sexual homicide with regard to Jose's biological father. What did you mean by that? Um, his father was involved in a gang rape of a 15-year-old girl that lost her life in a murder. He was Well, we know that being abused as a child raises your chance of being a perpetrator probably two and a half, three times than someone that was not abused in childhood. So these factors contributed cumulatively to place him at risk. And again, we look at the risk, but there weren't really protective factors. So he was never assessed or treated for mental health issues, for traumatic stress as a child or adolescent. And again, he was
symptoms of PTSD and not the complete diagnosis in much part because of the avoidance of them. Okay. And um, you said there was no record of a learning disability, but you are aware that he did graduate high school, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you use the term disinhibition. That is a medical term, correct? It's a medically recognized term. I, I would agree, yeah. yeah. Um, it's recognized as an orientation towards immediate gratification. Where did you get that? I found it online. Do you agree with that definition? Well, what, where online? I'm asking the question, sir. Do you agree with that definition? Well, yeah, I don't know what, well, I, I'm not sure what reference you're, you're using. I, I'm just but, asking if you agree with it. Do you agree with that definition? That it is, it is basically a lack of impulse control without yeah, the lack of impulse control, yes. Okay. Um, are you aware that neighbors in the complex describe Jose as having a bad temper and that they can hear him yelling and banging? Yes, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Okay. Um, Are you aware that he would photograph Mercedes while he was abusing her? I was, yes. Um, what, if anything, does that say about somebody? Your Honor, I object to speculation. Can I bring up rules? You can answer the question, if you can. Sure, sure, yeah. arms up in a crucifix with clothes over her head and he has multiple images of that um, are, are you saying that that is most likely um, some kind of, of gratuitous um, type of trophy your honor I, I would object because uh, there's never been any uh, link that he's oh, I'm sorry if you could uh, speak into your mic uh, your honor I would object in addition to my previously raised objections that there's no link um, to Jose I, I, it, it kind of goes blends with what I said before. We we often we're more at risk to, you know, model what we see. Okay, so. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll cut you off there. Did Jose ever say that his stepfather would take photos of him?
that's what we do. And we're more likely then to do it when we get older, even as an adult. And so there are a number of factors here, a number of traumatic events, certainly, and he had never been assessed or treated. And, and that goes, I think, for some of his siblings that have had difficulties as well. So it is a shame that this forensic examination is the first time he's ever been assessed or treated, and he would have needed that years ago, ideally. And uh, if CPS had been involved and do nothing, would that send some sort of a message to Jose as to uh, what they thought about what was going on? Yes, but it, it would also really relay that he would continue living in an unsafe chaotic environment. And when people live in that type of environment, they're, they're more likely to then engage in unstable relationships and then have this cycle repeat itself. And, and that's sadly what we see in this case. I've had to witness it this time. No further questions. All right, is this witness excused? Yes, Yes. yes. All right, thank you, Dr. Fabian. Thank you, Judge Boyd. Take care. Again, you don't have to memorize this. You will have a copy with you. Charge of the Court on Punishment. Members of the jury, by your verdict in count one, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count one of the indictment. By your verdict in count two, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon as charged in count two of the indictment. By your verdict in count three, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count three of the indictment. By your verdict in count four, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count four of the indictment. By your verdict in count five, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count five of the indictment. By your verdict in count six, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count six of the indictment. By your verdict in count seven, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count seven of the indictment. By your verdict in count eight, you have found the defendant, Jose Ruiz, guilty of the offense of injury to a child as charged in count eight of the indictment. It is necessary that the jury assess the punishment for these offenses. You are instructed that the punishment for the offense of injury to a child as charged in count one in the indictment is imprisonment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Institutional Division for life or for any term of not more than 99 years or less than five years. Therefore, you will assess the punishment of the defendant at life or any term of not more than 99 years or less than five years in count one. You are instructed that the punishment for the offense of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon as charged in count two of the indictment is imprisonment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Institutional Division for any term of not more than 20 years or less than two years. Therefore, you will assess the punishment of the defendant at any term of not more than 20 years or less than two years in count two. You are instructed that the punishment for the offense of injury to a child as charged in counts three through eight of the indictment is imprisonment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Institutional Division for any term of not more than 10 years or less than two years. Therefore, you will assess the punishment of the defendant at any term of not more than 10 years or less than two years and counts three through eight. In addition to imprisonment, an individual found guilty of these offenses may be punished by a fine not to exceed $10,000. And if you choose to assess a fine, in addition to imprisonment, you will assess such fine and so state in each verdict. If you assess a fine, it is not paid to the victim or victims, if any, but is paid into the registry of the court. The defendant in this case has applied on written sworn motion for community supervision 
stating, among other things, that he has never been convicted of a felony in this or any other state. Our statutes provide that where a defendant is found guilty of the offenses of injury to a child and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and the jury assesses the punishment at not more than 10 years, and they further find that the defendant has never been convicted of a felony in this or any other state, the jury may, within its discretion, recommend community supervision during the good pay behavior of the defendant. If the jury does recommend community supervision, it will be granted by the court. If there is any evidence before you that the defendant may have committed any offense or act of misconduct other than the offense of which you have convicted him, you are instructed that you may use that evidence, if any, in assessing punishment in this case, but only if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed such other offense or act of misconduct, if any. In the event you have a reasonable doubt as to whether any such other offense or act of misconduct was committed or as to whether the defendant was involved in such other offense or act of misconduct, then you will wholly disregard the evidence, if any, which may relate to any such matter. You are instructed that the defendant may testify on his own behalf if he chooses to do so. But if he elects not to do so, that fact cannot be taken by you as a circumstance against him nor prejudice him in any way. The defendant has elected not to testify in this punishment phase of trial. And you are instructed that you cannot and must not refer or allude to that fact throughout your deliberations or take it into consideration for any purpose whatsoever. In your deliberations, you may consider evidence introduced during the guilt phase of the trial as well as any evidence introduced at the punishment phase of the trial. Under the instructions herein given, it will not be proper for you in determining the penalty to be assessed to fix the same by lot, chance, any system of averages, or any other method than by a full, fair, and free exercise of the opinion of the individual jurors under the evidence admitted before you. The length of time for which the defendant is in prison may be reduced by the award of parole. Under the law applicable to counts one and two in this case, if the defendant is sentenced to a term of imprisonment, the defendant will not be eligible for parole until the actual time served equals one half of the sentence imposed or 30 years, whichever is less. If the defendant is sentenced to a term of less than four years, the defendant must serve at least two years before the defendant is eligible for parole. Eligibility for parole does not guarantee that parole will be granted. It cannot accurately be predicted how the parole law might be applied to this defendant if sentenced to a term of imprisonment. Because the application of that law will depend on decisions made by parole authorities. You may consider the existence of the parole law. You are not to consider the manner in which the parole law may be applied to this particular defendant. Under the law applicable to counts three through eight in this case, the defendant is sentenced to a term of imprisonment may earn early parole eligibility through the award of good conduct time. Prison authorities may award good conduct time to a prisoner who exhibits good behavior, diligence in carrying out prison work assignments and attempts at rehabilitation. If a prisoner engages in misconduct, prison authorities may also take away all or part of any good conduct time earned by the prisoner. Under the law applicable to counts three through eight in this case, if the defendant is sentenced to a term of imprisonment, the defendant will not become eligible for parole until the actual time served plus any good time conduct time earned equals one fourth of the sentence imposed. Eligibility for parole does not guarantee that parole will be granted. It cannot accurately be predicted how the parole law and good conduct time might be applied to this defendant if sentenced to a term of imprisonment. Because the application of these laws will depend on decisions made by prison and parole authorities. You may consider the existence of the parole law and good conduct time. However, you are not to consider the extent to which good conduct time may be awarded to or forfeited by this particular defendant. You are not to consider the manner in which parole law may be applied to this particular defendant. Suitable forms are attached here too for your verdicts if you should care to use them. However, such forms are not intended to influence you in any way in arriving at your verdict. In any event, each verdict must be unanimous in writing and signed by your presiding juror, respectfully submitted, Judge Stephanie Boyd, 187 Judicial District Court, Bexar County, Texas. State, are you prepared to proceed? 
And I'd like to reserve my time for rebuttal, please. All right, defense. Thank you, Jen. <coughs> Chapter two in this case is a charge of a verdicts. And I asked you when we started to stay with me, if you can, please, to hear chapter one. Chapter one of Jose Ruiz's life, because I know when you heard the evidence on guilt and innocence, you said, how can this be? How can this happen? How in this world can this happen? And I hope that through the testimony of my witnesses, what you've heard today, I hope you can help to understand some of the context that brought us here today, because it's important. Jose had the curse of a double whammy. And what I mean by that is Dr. Fabian talked about nurture and nature. And Jose was cursed by nature with a genetic predisposition towards horrific violence committed by his biological father, who he's never met in person, by the way. And then, Jose was cursed with horrific trauma within the home that tended to normalize that abuse in his life experience. He was, what was modeled for him was abuse, trauma, chaos, lack of attachment, um, physical pain related to discipline, um, these were things that were modeled for him and he experienced as a young child. As early as approximately age one and a half to two years, he was in the hospital with internal injuries, having been beaten by his stepfather. So it is no small thing I'm talking about here when I say to you that this cycle of abuse rolls on. And it is not an excuse here, but it is a way to maybe put some context on it, and I think that's important when you go back to consider punishment. What is the context here, and what are the kinds of things that um, I ask that you think about, which are how the, this intergenerational abuse occurred in his life. Dr. Fabian said, the more the worse, the earlier the worse, and that's what Jose experienced. He experienced more, and that created the worst possible situation. He experienced it early, which contributed to the worst possible situation. And what do I mean? That his risk of, of committing the same behavior was higher and was elevated due to what he experienced in his life. Again, it's not an excuse. We know we've applied for probation, but um, you have a large range of punishment to consider in front of you and on many counts. And we're asking that you please go back and when you consider the range of punishment, consider the story of his whole life. Consider the abuse that he uh, experienced at the hands of his stepfather, um, hitting him in the head daily, becoming dizzy at times and losing consciousness or passing out because his stepfather hit him in the head with a cane or a fist or a shoe. That was his life on a daily basis. What else did he uh, experience in terms of head injury and trauma and concussion at age 12? Uh, and these all contributed to neurological difficulties that he experienced. He, Dr. Fabian talked to you about complex trauma, polytrauma, concussions, hit in the head daily, and those things had a terrible impact on Jose's worldview, on his worldview, and on his ability to assess appropriate punishment, his ability to assess what's right or wrong because he learned what was modeled for him. No one intervened on his behalf. No one acted in a protective way towards Jose. It happened and it happened and it happened again, 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 day after day, and no one did anything. What is the message that that sends to him? Well, I guess it's normal. It's normalized in my world. No one's doing anything about it. I guess I just have to suffer, and that's the way we do. And that is part one of Jose's life that brings him here today. 
And we're asking you to consider those things. And when you consider punishment for Jose, to please take into account the mitigating circumstances of his life and return a punishment on the low end, please. Thank you. You know who doesn't get a chapter two? Mercedes Lasoya. She didn't even get to finish chapter one. I'm going to talk about some housekeeping issues first. Judge mentioned this in the charge. The fine doesn't matter. It doesn't go to Mercedes family. It doesn't go to Jordan. It goes to the court system. Do what you want to with the fine. We're not going to ask you to assess any fine, but if you want to, go right ahead. Punishment on each of these eight counts does not stack. It does not run. Your Honor, I object to that being uh, stated to the jury. Sustained. I would ask that the jury be instructed to disregard that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're instructed to disregard. And Your Honor, based on the fact that I believe that uh, creates a constitutional violation against my client's rights to fair trial and due process, I ask for this. All right, that would be denied. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you're to ignore that. Does everyone understand? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Let's talk about some things that defense counsel brought up. They're asking you to consider Jose's whole life, the story of his whole life. I'm asking you to consider Mercedes' life and the life that she does not get to live. The life of torture and abuse that this man did to her. And defense wants you to believe that it's not his fault because this is what happened to him. This is learned behavior. Well, you know what? Jose himself told y'all when he was talking to Detective Size that no way would he have ever done those things to Mercedes Lasoya because he knows how it feels. He knew how it felt the things that he did to that little girl. He knew what he was doing. And his mother got up here and told you he knows right from wrong. And that jail call tells you he knew what he was doing was wrong. I'm not gonna show you the horrible pictures again. I am gonna show you one slide if it's connected. If not, uh, Brittany brought up in her closing the timeline of the day of that thumbtack picture. And that shortly thereafter, that ring camera picture of the thumbtacks were the bound crucifix nude photos of Mercedes. And now you've learned that two minutes later, he's taking a picture of her vagina. Your Honor, I object. That's not in evidence at all. It was yes. testified. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll remember the evidence that, as you heard it. You now heard from people who loved Mercedes. You've heard about Jordan, how Jordan carries a bear, and she likes to sleep with a bear that she calls Sissy because she misses her sister. But she's now changed her name to carry on her sister's name. Her favorite color is purple because that was her sissy's favorite color. You've heard from Uncle Rodney, who wanted this little girl. They wanted her. They could have taken good care of her. And he took that from them. Thank you, Judge. The prior abuse is no excuse. Somebody has to end the cycle. People who are abused go on to not abuse other people every day. People who are below average or unintelligent or on cannabis or have symptoms of PTSD go on to not beat and torture little girls. This is not an excuse. Did he show mercy to Mercedes when he put thumbtacks in her feet? 
Did he show mercy to Mercedes when he beat her repeatedly, locked her in a closet, put dog feces, urine in her mouth? Absolutely not. That little girl was a happy, feisty little girl who deserved to live her life and not be tortured at the hands of Jose Ruiz. I ask that you not show him any mercy, just like he did not show Mercedes any mercy, and sentence him to the max punishment allowed on each count. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, Debbie and Laura will take you to the back, and the previous four that I've talked to before, she'll take you to a separate room. Everyone, please rise for the jurors. <laughs>
for victim impact? Yes, Your Honor, we have one family member who wants to speak on behalf of that. All right. Who is that? Just one moment. So it's the court's understanding that a verdict has been reached as far as punishment is concerned. There are not to be any outbursts in the courtroom. If there are outbursts, you will be removed. Does everyone understand? All right. We're ready. All right for the jury. gentlemen it's the court's <coughs> understanding is that you've reached a verdict as it relates to punishment is that correct yes, yes, your honor. and is that verdict unanimous yes, yes, yes your honor. Honor. all right if you'll pass the verdict form to deputy Laura please all right with regards to count one we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of life and no fine. Count two, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 20 years, no fine. Count three, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 10 years, no fine. Count four, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 10 years, no fine. Count five, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 10 years, no fine. Count six, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice System for a term of 10 years, no fine. <coughs> Count seven, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 10 years, no fine. Count eight, we assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 10 years, no fine. 
Would anyone wish to have the jury poll state? No, Your Honor. Defense? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let Deputy Laura take you back uh, to the jury room, and I'll meet you there shortly. Everyone, please rise for the jurors. <coughs> Everyone, please be seated. All right, Mr. Ruiz, having been found guilty and the punishment been assess assessed by the jury, as to uh, count one, the court will sentence you to life in prison, give you credit for any time served. I'm unable to stack these sentences, therefore, the sentences will run concurrently. Count one through eight will run concurrent. Count two, your punishment is to be assessed at 20 years in the prison. Count three, through eight, your punishment is to be assessed at 10 years in the prison. In each cause number, you will receive credit for any time served. Is there anything else from either side with regards to punishment? State? No, good. All right, defense? No, All right, Mr. Ruiz, did you review the document entitled Trial Court Certification of Defendant's Rights to Appeals with your attorney? Did you understand it and did you sign it? Yes, ma'am. All right, this is not a plea. You do have a right to an appeal. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right. Is there a victim impact? All right, you may proceed, and you'll have to uh, give it from back there seated.
as we are haunted by flashbacks of those devastating images that we are forced to live with. The pain is unsolvable, and the loss of Mercedes has left an irreparable in, in, void in our hearts. But it is nothing compared to what Mercedes had to live through. In addition to the grief and anguish caused by the loss of our beloved niece Mercedes, there is a burden of guilt and frustration that also weighs heavily on our hearts. Many outsiders have questioned why no one intervened to help Mercedes in her time of need. We want to express that we tried everything in our legal power to protect Mercedes from harm. Repeatedly, we reached out to authorities to share reports of concerns about Mercedes' well-being. Emily would beg Katrina, her mother, to allow her to care for Mercedes and her sister Jordan, especially after witnessing Mercedes plea that she was treated differently. Each time, her efforts were met with the same response. Nothing is found, nothing is wrong, nothing can be done. Despite her persistent efforts to advocate for Mercedes' safety, she was met with hurdles and indifferences. It is a source of deep regret and anguish that these pleas for help went unanswered, and the tragic consequences of this failure are impossible to bear. Our children, Mercedes' cousin and Jordan, her sister, or who were particularly close. Her cousins and her sister had a trans transcendent mirror. They were best friends, confidence, and playmates. The thought of our children growing up without their beloved cousin Mercedes is a devastating reality that we struggle to comprehend. Their innocence was shattered by the cruel hand of fate and the loss of their companionship weighs heavily on their hearts. Your Honor, I urge you to consider the full extent of harm caused by the defendant's actions when determining the appropriate sentence. No amount of punishment can undo the pain and suffering inflicted upon Mercedes and our family, but justice demands accountability and recognition of the harm done. In closing, I plead once again for Mercedes. Her life was tragically cut short leaving behind shattered dreams and broken hearts. As we grapple with the pain of her, of her absence, we seek hope that her memory will be honored and her voice and the voice of other children who are in similar situations will be heard. Thank you for allowing us to share our statement with the court. Yes. As soon as you all hand that to me, okay. 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 Okay.